Good morning and welcome to the very first day of the all new online only CES 2021. We'd like to thank you for joining us. Depending on where you are, it's either very late or very early like it is for us here in New York. I am senior mobile editor Chris Velasco and to kick off the show right with me this morning is Engadget Reviews editor Sherlyn Lowe. Sherlyn, how's it going? It is early in the morning here in New York, but I but it's the perfect time for our friends in Asia. So thank you so much for joining us, whatever yes, time zone you're in. Asia crew, thank you for joining <laughs> us. We really appreciate it. So, Sherlyn, this is, look, the weirdest CES we've ever had to cover, not least of which because you're in your apartment and I'm in my basement. And neither of us are in Las Vegas having a particularly weird or fun time. How How has mm -hmm. everything kind of going for you so far? My biggest thing so far is that for the viewer who has experienced previous CESs from home, online only for the last few years, right? They're, for the first time ever, their experience is not going to be that much different from us, right? Because we're usually on the ground. It's a very different. It's a very harried, frenzied experience for us on the ground. And the viewer kind of gets to watch from afar. Now we're kind of in that same place as uh, people who might not have the chance to visit CES for themselves. And I think for them, I want to make this experience feel, you know, more intimate and more close than ever. I think we're, we're, we're able to speak more directly with you, even from our own homes as we watch from afar as well. How about you, V? What's like, what's, what's this so weird, super weird digital see us been like for you? <laughs> I mean, in the run-up to the event, I mean, we're always kind of doing the same thing, right? We're always heads down, we're taking meetings, we're writing news, we're making sure the news goes up on time. That much hasn't changed. What I feel like I've really kind of missed going into this CES is just sort of like the little rituals that kind of prep me mm -hmm. for the day. So, and, and I was going to ask you about this, but, you know, <laughs> it's day one of CES. This is, if we were in Vegas, not the first day we would have been on the ground hustling. We'd be at yes. any number of events kind of gearing up for today, but... You know, I usually like to prep in the morning, just like belting out a Broadway song, having like three Ugh. or four cups of coffee, uh, because we're starting so much earlier than we would had we done this live in Vegas, which is, again, not possible this year. I, I'd be looking yeah. at us. It's a slightly different routine, but I feel like the energy is yeah. good. And I think you've got a really great point there. We do now get to experience CES the way most people get to experience CES. And I think that'll bring us all a little bit closer together in the way that we kind of work through the show. And speaking mm -hmm. of that, we've got a lot going on this week, a lot going on today, yeah. as a matter of fact. Sherlyn, run us through really quickly kind of what we can expect yes. to see in the day to come. So for you guys watching from home, you don't have to go to all kinds of different sources to get your full CES experience. You'll have it right here if you just keep it locked to the Engadget YouTube channel or Engadget.com, where we're also streaming this video live to you, 20, uh, well, not 24-7, but all day uh, from January 11th to January 13th. So for today, we've got big keynotes, right? This is the press day. We've got all of the big companies like LG, Samsung, Mercedes-Benz. Uh, they've got keynotes today from 8 a.m., 9 a.m., uh, and all the way through later in the day, we've got also Sony at about 4 p.m. Uh, or 5 p.m. Eastern later today. We have the whole schedule for our virtual stage on Engadget.com. You can go check it out over there and, you know, make a calendar invite for yourself if there's something you're particularly interested in. But it's not just the big company keynotes. We at Engadget have also prepared a special selection of panels from our topic experts for you. So we've got Chris Shaw from our Upscaled Lip series uh, talking all about chips and risk five and the future of computing. That's all very exciting for those people interested in those topics. And then we've got, Chris, I think you have some uh, panels for this show all together too, right? What are you excited about? So I've got a couple lined up. Nothing I really want to give away right now because <laughs> that's why I didn't want to. Like, <laughs> one of these panels came together completely last minute. I literally slid into <laughs> a guy's DMs, and I think it's going to work out really, really well. So stay tuned for that. Just to give everyone at home a quick sense of what's happening this morning, we are be mm -hmm. we'll be kind of hanging out here, sort of working through our opening remarks until about 8 a.m. Eastern. At that point, we'll kick it yep. to the LG live streamed press conference. We're going to run that. Uh, sort of uninterrupted, after which senior editor Devendra Hardwar and I will be around to sort of dissect the announcements, put them in a larger context. That is going to go from 8.30 to 9 a.m. Eastern, at which point we're moving directly into the Samsung press conference, the theme of which is, I believe, uh, Samsung exploring the concept of a new normal. Obviously, the events of the last year have made life quite unconventional for most of us, to say the <laughs> yeah. absolute least. So I'm curious to see what Samsung says about 
uh, sort of the new normal and how its vision to the home and to AI and to its devices sort of feed into that vision. Following that at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time, Sherlyn and I will be back here to talk about Samsung's announcements. And then we have, I believe, about a half hour of sort of hands-on time. So we were fortunate enough to very safely, I have to stress, very safely went to uh, a Samsung space to check out some of Samsung's new products, the new TVs, which they've uh, mm -hmm. already kind of discussed to some extent. Um, so we'll be kind of running through our experience with those things. And then at 1030, Devendra Hardwar can't keep that guy down. He's coming back <laughs> with uh, a panel with Samsung to talk about their uh, new announcements and just sort of where Samsung goes from here. So that's, that's just the morning. We've got two major press conferences. I should point out after Samsung is Mercedes-Benz. So right up until mm -hmm. noon, we've got big announcement after big announcement after big announcement. So if you've got time this morning, I strongly encourage you to come join us as we sort of unpack the news and, and put things in a greater context for you, because that's just what we like doing around here. Yes, and then speaking of some of those panels I brought up, I myself am far more than happy to give away what I've got going on. I have a panel on <laughs> what <laughs> laptops will look like in 2021 and beyond with uh, companies like Lenovo and HP. Uh, now, CES is a big show for laptops every year because the companies announce their new, you know, their new upgrades with the latest Intel or AMD processors. And this is also a chip show. So taking all of that into account, we've also got companies making really interesting looking devices. So I really wanted to talk to these two companies to me uh, were innovating right on the front of uh, laptops and then have them tell us what they think laptops will be like in 2021. And it's not just about 5G, it's about the quirky, the weird stuff. So I want to have you all stay tuned for that. But it's not just about the media day, right? There's also Tuesday and Wednesday. So we've got we've got all kinds of content planned and it will culminate in the best of CES awards. The oh, Engadget will for the eighth year in a row judge the official best of CES awards. So us editors will be <laughs> keeping a close eye on what is being announced throughout the show in various categories. Uh, for example, I'm looking at the best wearables and course the best PCs so you know shout us out on Twitter by the way if you have anything that caught your eye that you think we should really take a closer look at or you know if companies haven't already nominated themselves feel free to give me a tip um, but also you'll have a say in the People's Choice Awards which we'll be uh, allowing the public to vote on come Tuesday January 12th so make sure you keep an eye out on Engadget.com for that. That is such a great point. Sherlyn and I and the rest of the staff here at Engadget, we've been really hitting the press releases. We've been talking to companies. We've seen and heard about a lot already, but we haven't seen and heard about everything. So if there's something that you discover while on your virtual travails at virtual CES that you think is interesting and maybe deserves a Best of CES award, please let us know. You can tweet at Sherlyn and I. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Chris Velasco. Sherlyn, where can people find you? Mine's at Sherlyn Lowe, C-H-E-R-L-Y-N-N-L-O-W. That's on Twitter. Um, yeah, I mean, make sure you let us know because sometimes we, we try our best, but sometimes we miss the the smaller stuff, the, the places the, that, that don't have PR companies to reach out to us. Um, but one of make sure you take a look at the Best of CES uh, criteria that's already on Engadget.com. They do need to be an official CES exhibitor. Um, and then also take a look at the categories we've got. It's There's a lot. I mean, there's the best sustainable technology. There's, there's, you know, best for gaming, all kinds of stuff, best accessibility tech. So I, I just feel like you're going to get the most comprehensive look because we've got people assigned to all of those awards categories, paying close attention to all of those. If you want even more detail than what this video show might be able to provide, you can go to Engadget.com where we'll have articles all the time on all of the news that is breaking out of CES 2021. <laughs> <laughs> our poor team has been so hard at work. Oh, I man. just want to shout out our hardworking team members who are not on the stage with us right now, but really should be taking a bow because they've just really been putting in so much hard work over the last week. Absolutely. 
Yeah, CES is always a, a struggle, to say the least. Just because, you know, as, as a media company, as a team, you want to put out the best, most thorough coverage possible. And every year, we go absolutely wild on the show floor trying oh, to yeah. give you guys oh, yeah. exactly that. But, you know, now that we're all at home and we're not all seeing each other, I, you're right. It is hugely important to shout out and give huge thanks to our tremendous team, both on the editorial side and on the video side, helping us yes. bring you our live coverage of CES 2021. Absolutely. We couldn't have done it without these amazing people and I'm so so grateful to be working with all of them I just want to say too like the stage that we're on right now we got a real glow up oh yeah shout <laughs> out to the stage y'all <laughs> This will be the scene for our virtual stage. Take a look around. I mean, there's not that much to so-called explore, but you know, hopefully this will help better present the information that we want to give to you guys. You can pay closer attention to the details that you need. And you know, there'll be some little, you know, tidbits here and there, I think, in the background if you spot, but make sure to tell us how you feel about our new stage environment. I mean, it makes me feel like I'm in CS. Uh, or in Las Vegas Convention Center without actually being there. I almost feel, like I said before, I almost feel the static from the carpet already, this faux digital that's, carpet. Uh, that's crazy talk. That's crazy talk. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will say, I do appreciate having, I don't know if we could look at the quote unquote window, but you might have seen it on yeah. the sort of swoop in to introduce us. There's there's sort of a faux desert out there and you do not know how badly I wish I could walk out into that faux desert and just sort of plop oh. on the ground and be with the universe. But instead I'm here with you and that's also a great thing. Uh, Sherlyn, we've okay. got to, I think we've run through a lot of what we needed to get through. Um, so yeah. I want to circle back to a point I made earlier about CES rituals, right? Everyone mm -hmm. who's covered the show more than once has a sense of what has to happen in the sort of morning before yes. things really kick off in earnest. What is your CES ritual? What are you doing before the show gets going? I am in an effort to not panic. Usually I have seven spreadsheets, one of which is my show floor schedule. So I'll have the I'll have, you know, maybe a week and a half around, you know, CES show days official will be right in the middle. And then the first two days will be like embargoes, 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 pre-briefing, pre-briefing, pre-briefings. And then the actual show floor days are packed with, you know, hands-on appointments and companies that I might not have seen otherwise. So it is usually very full, but it's been fully replaced this year with this, you know, with a schedule for my virtual stage hits. And then other than that, I'm just at home. I'm just not not trying to rush to a million different appointments. And I don't know that I miss it. And I, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe this gives me the calm that I'm getting from being in one place might help me be able to think more broadly about what's going on at CES 2021. What are the big trends? What are the big topics? I, I'll be able to think all the time about it instead of uh, just waiting till the last day to reflect and see what I've, I've seen. Uh, <laughs> no, that's that, a really great point, right? Yours? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say that I I am very much a trade show person. I'm very much a field right. person. So the more right. time I can spend sort of like jostling through crowds and rushing to Ugh. meetings and feeling like I'm getting something done, like the physicality of that is actually very important to me. I, I really do enjoy that. So not having that this year is definitely putting me in a bit of a different headspace. But to your mm -hmm. point, I think it's really important to note that, yeah, because we don't have to like... I don't know, fight through crowds and like wave people yeah. off of tripods because we have to get yeah. to a booth at this time or else we don't get to yeah. shoot whatever we're going to shoot or whatever it is. Because we mm -hmm. have to spend less energy worrying about the logistics of being at a place covering things, we do get mm -hmm. more time and more brain power freed up effectively to just think about yes. how all of these things fit together, how important yes. they are and how important they will continue to be as the year progresses. I will say, though, I mean, like, there's a lot of good stuff, right, with being at home versus being on the show floor itself. For example, I, I'm going to eat a lot better uh, for one. I think there will be. <laughs> I'll be taking better care of myself. I will be sticking to a sleep schedule instead of going out at night and having dinners with my coworkers. But that's the other thing is you and I have both said many times now that we're obviously going to miss the camaraderie of being with our teammates, but also with our friends from the industry. You know, we're friends with other publications, too. And it'll be nice to see people we don't usually see here in New York. We'll be able to catch up with friends from, say, the West Coast or 
or in Arizona, Phoenix, where Jess Condit is from. Um, the other thing I'm going to miss, too, is seeing these companies' products in person. Um, there's something about really being able to check something out and being moved by maybe a founder's story uh, that doesn't translate quite so well on email and maybe perhaps not over Zoom even. And I think that's one of the things I will miss. I, don't, I feel like I get a better sense of the excitement for a product, the authenticity of a person telling me the story about the product at the show floor itself. And that's one of the things that perhaps that's maybe why CES will never go away, even if it did shift to a virtual version this year. I think if we think about CES 2022 for a second, <laughs> are you excited or are you hopeful at all that we might be able to have an in-person CES 2022 or is it too early to say? I mean, like I said, I'm a, I'm a field person. I'm an events person. So yes. I am hoping against hope with every fiber of my now considerable being that we do get to meet <laughs> with each other again in Las Vegas or wherever see it. Like, it doesn't have to be Vegas, yeah. guys. Like, sure, take yeah. a look at a map. Pick, pick a, like, if you, Summer Sea, yes, I believe used to be in Chicago uh, up until <laughs> the mid-90s or so. So clearly there's been some flexibility in where you could do this. But point is, I'm hoping against hope we get to reunite, uh, not just us, obviously, but also our tremendous crew. I love our UK team, who we so rarely oh, get Lord, to yes. see. And they're amazing mm -hmm. people. Uh, as you said, everyone on the West Coast, getting everyone together again would be a real blast. But I mean, more importantly, from a coverage perspective, you raise a really great point. There's there's nothing like the sort of immediate reaction and sort of gratification you get and, uh, and validation, I think, as well. When you yeah. sort of go up to a booth or meet a startup in Eureka Park and you see, you know, something in person that might not have made for a particularly great pitch. Maybe the yeah. maybe the person writing it was like just sort of OK or didn't have a great day or for whatever <laughs> reason. It didn't inspire much in you. But then you go see it and you see the mm -hmm. founders in action. You see the reaction that people are sort of giving these people for their work. It, it gives you sort of a lot of a uh, lot of signals to sort of inform mm -hmm. the way you look at things. But it's just not really available when you're taking Zoom calls. So, I mean, for a lot of reasons, I, I really hope that CES goes physical again. I do believe that will happen again, hopefully next year. But if not, you know, the year after that. But yeah, I, I would love <laughs> to just get everyone back in a trailer again with some beers and a lot of frenzied writing. And karaoke. That's one of the things I miss the most is trailer karaoke i love blasting the music and annoying everyone <laughs> in the trailer I, oh, oh also oh, pranks go ahead <laughs> yeah, I pranks was on the team mm, so we have about uh believe about 13 minutes before we kick it over to the lg press conference which gives us ample time to discuss shulin's terrible <laughs> prank <laughs> this is the one reason why i would be happy to not be in a trailer with you specifically again wow, so wow, wow. and one of our senior editors i believe was it robbie yeah, it was Robbie Roberto Baldwin before he left Engadget, um, and him and I teamed up to. Every year we ask each other what should our prank on the team be at CES this year, and the one year we effectively pulled one off was 2019, uh, when or was it 2020? 2020, I think. Yeah, where he where we pretended, uh, we made a gizmo. Uh, and uh, that would play a cat sound, mewing sound of a cat uh, every few minutes or so and then he stuck it on the door uh, within inside the trailer on one of the doors inside the trailer and it drove people insane to think that there was a poor cat stuck in the trailer somewhere and so one afternoon i was walking back to the trailer and the entire team had just it's just crawling around on their hands and knees in the parking lot of the convention center looking under our trailer for this missing cat and me and robbie were like what have we done but this is kind of fun it was, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, myself, at least one other person, uh, Brett Putman, one of our uh, sort of freelance video editors, uh, we were just like crawling on the floor, I like looking Brett, for yeah. vents and ducts and open spaces where, because cats oh. obviously very flexible, can fit in a lot of places. We, we just like, I think at one point Brett went under the trailer to he just did. like look up underneath it and see if a cat. So you, you, I mean, pr kudos to you. If your intent was to <laughs> thoroughly mess with our heads, you did a tremendous job, but I also hate you forever. <laughs> Thankfully, no real cats were harmed and no fake yes, cats were even literally. harmed all in this prank. Okay in our book. <laughs> they were all fine. They just really uh, gaslit us in a really ultimately also, funny way. But <laughs> yes. 
it was mm-hmm. ultimately fun reveal, but it was also fun to see Engadget editors get, you know, their their hearts are in the right place and they were spotting cats all over Vegas afterwards that they were taking pictures and sending to the team and saying, we found the cat when there was an actual fact, no <laughs> cat. Um, but Engadget editors clearly have a good heart. <laughs> Me and Robbie are happy that our prank proved that people were good and had consciences. Um, you, you other than pranks, I will say... Situation. <laughs> the silver lining. Other than <laughs> pranks, I will say one of the things I miss about CES is just the, the booth experiences. Walking into Samsung's booth, or LG's actually, might be one of my favorites every year because they just really go all out and line all the walls with these TVs that make you feel as if you're in a canyon and stuff like that. And it's like the tech lover's version of Disneyland sometimes. So do you feel like the same way, V? No, for sure. It's it's easy for us to take it for granted, right? Because in, in a yeah. more normal year, when we're going to events, God, every couple of weeks, it seems like, there is, there's right. always some new spectacle to be enthralled by. Like going to a Samsung mm-hmm. press conference, for example, sort of like the one we're going to see today, you would see, you know, an entire like basketball court, like covered with screens yeah. and stuff. Like really ostentatious yeah. stuff. And obviously these are ways for companies to flex what they're working on, but also just like very interesting experiences in and of themselves. So there's yeah. there's definitely with a lack of physicality for this CES, there's definitely a dimension of that missing. But mm-hmm. I think that also maybe just gives us something to look forward to for next time. For sure. I would love for our viewers to let us know over Twitter or maybe if you're on the YouTube chat or leave a comment. Um, you know, tell us what it is you'd like to see from a virtual CES, because since there isn't a physical one, what can companies do to really reel you in and keep you interested? Other than interesting product announcements, um, what would make the experience more convention like for you? Maybe it's a VR experience. Maybe it's a maybe we really need to step up our efforts on the VR front or or is something else we haven't thought about. Let us know. Um, I'm on Twitter at Sherlyn Lowe, Chris. You're also on Twitter, aren't you? Yep, I am uh, at Chris Velasco. And and since we just <laughs> mentioned YouTube, uh, Sherlyn and I, I mean, whenever we get to do streams, and this is something that we are, I, I like to think, pretty good at generally. We love sort of watching <laughs> the chat on YouTube. So I've, I've just jumped over into the chat. Shouts out to everybody. Um, people are enthralled by the cat stuff. Some people, <laughs> some people are asking if we're the same as CNET. We're definitely not the same as CNET. We're, we're uh, I like CNET. to think, much cooler. And we're based in New York, Sherlyn and I. Well, New York-ish in her case, uh, as opposed to San Francisco. Hey. So well, I'm just, you know, you're very <laughs> true, proud of true. the fact that you're a Jersey person. And as a former and lifelong Jersey person, I'm there for you. I respect <laughs> that. But suffice it to say, you're not, you're not really a New Yorker right now. Okay, um, I get it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, So we'll be keeping an eye on the chat. We do have about eight minutes to go until we kick it over to the first big press conference of the day. That is going to be LG. So if you have anything that you'd like to talk about or let us know about, we're monitoring our Twitter and the the chat here on YouTube. Um, So yeah, we'd love to hear what you think because frankly, we've been talking for a while and uh, it'd be great to get someone else's thoughts into the mix. I mean, I think this is the whole point of doing a virtual show. This CES in particular is to, like I said, interact with you guys, feel like this is a show we're all watching together instead of having two versions of this show. On the show floor at CES, a real C or an in-person CES, I wouldn't have really much time to check my Twitter or look at my socials. And and now I'm just kind of like, I, it's as if I'm watching the season premiere of, of a show that I really love and I have to <laughs> live tweet it and I have to watch it with friends and, and all of social media. This is sort of, I think, the same experience and I would love for everyone to enjoy it together. I mean, of course, some of us have been spoiled ahead of time, right? And that's part of part of the reason we're still, you know, slightly we're still here to offer commentary because we had a bit more time to digest some of this information. Some of the companies have been kind enough to brief us ahead of time on what their announcements might be, but that's not all the companies, right? And so for some of the news, we'll be reacting the same instant you are. And I think that that will be a lot of fun. Uh, I don't know, V, is that, is that for you the same, like it's fun or is it like horrifying? 
I, I mean, it's a little bit of both, to be honest. But I do, I do enjoy <laughs> the idea, and we've we've touched on this theme many times in the first, you know, twenty five minutes of this conversation. That like, mm -hmm. I, I we both really appreciate the fact that we do kind of get the same ex the same CES experience as everybody else. But I, I to put it a more finer point on it, if you and I were in Las, if this was a live show and you and I were mm -hmm. doing the opening remarks at CES in Las Vegas, we'd be up on a stage. We wouldn't be around yeah. anybody. It would be the two of us like right. on a couch. Uh, and, yeah. and just sort of both digitally and physically removed from the goings on in a way. But now that right. we're here doing this, yes, we're not in the same place. You know, yes, we're not going to be, you know, in the same place for quite some time. But mm -hmm. we're still kind of at it. We're, I think I, I personally feel more connected to our audience. And I'm sure you do as well. So yeah. we, we're, we're losing some stuff in the transition to a virtual CES. But I think arguably we do gain even more. I think so. And I think just to remind people who might have just joined us because it's getting to a more reasonable time of day in New York, um, we are still hoping that you will at least keep it locked in Gadget.com. You can get a full CES experience just by staying here. We'll be bringing you all the highlights on our virtual stage show. But also make sure to go to Engadget.com, especially on Tuesday, January 12th. If you have something that you think needs to be a Best of CES award winner, remember Engadget is for the eighth year in a row judging the official Best of CES awards. So if there's something you saw in the news that caught your eye that you thought this will make a difference in the world, send in a nomination, send us a tip on Twitter so it will get our attention. And then come Tuesday, January 12th, if you go to Engadget.com, we will be opening up the voting to the public for the People's Choice Award. So you have a say in what gets an award, and that might make all the difference in whether a company gets recognition for the rest of the year or not. And as we said, CES usually sets the stage for the rest of the year, right? In terms of technology, this is where we see all the trends that are going to trickle out over the rest of the year. Usually it's a lot of TVs and, you know, all the buzzwords will start getting thrown out here. But there's also a lot of car tech. There's also a lot of smart home tech, wearables, pet tech, beauty tech. There's just so much to see at CES 2021. V, what are you most excited about that's not one of the big topics? I got to tell you, I have real. So part of my purview at Engadget during CES is obviously having some of best of CES. My categories yes. tend to be best mobile product, which is very much within my wheelhouse, and best startup, which I used to cover very thoroughly in a past life and still kind of keep tabs on. And the process of now kind of getting to know young companies, startups, in a way that mm -hmm. you know is in some ways the only thing that's available is different than it used to be, but it's no less yeah. gratifying, right? Especially yeah. because... CES, maybe not a lot of people are aware of this because it's so defined by the big events. You know, CES has a huge and thriving startup culture attached to it. Mm -hmm. And getting to know these people, getting to know their work, getting to know what problems they feel need fixing is always kind of a meaningful approach for me. And getting to experience that, again, in some way in 2021 has been really gratifying, too. So that's that's been great. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's the thing I feel the most, the, 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 the worst for is the companies that would normally, you know, save up for a long time to book a small little booth at CES at Sands, maybe where it's a startup air, area, and they get to get all this exposure from that. And the returns on that sort of investment is, is huge for them. But this year, I feel like maybe less so, maybe this year they need to do the traditional hire a really good PR firm and blast out marketing on their behalf sort of move that a lot more seasoned companies are. So there's much more noise for them to cut through as opposed to being at Startup Alley where reporters like yourself, Chris, would go to to check out everything that they've got to show and that's how they catch your eye. Um, but we'll see. Hopefully, we'll be able to still be interacting with these companies uh, on some level. We've got two minutes, like you've been reminding everyone, to the start of LG's keynote, which is when uh, we'll switch this feed over to that. V, any closing thoughts you wanted to share with our audience? No, I think we've rambled at people for quite enough time. Yeah, we have. But I do want to say a really heartfelt thank you to everyone who has joined us so far this morning. I'm looking at YouTube right now. We've got like 400 people. I don't know why wow. you're here with us, but I'm so grateful that you are. I hope you're enjoying me and Sherlyn just hanging out as we usually do. But yes, two minutes to go until the uh, LG press conference. Quick reminder, LG press conference, 8 to 8.30. Following that, myself and senior editor Devendra Hardwar will be walking through the announcements, putting them in greater context. That's been 
between 8.30 and 9. 9 a.m. Eastern is when Samsung's press conference starts. So there's going to be, and that's, again, just like the tip of the iceberg for the day. Mercedes-Benz is after Samsung. We've got a packed afternoon full of uh, live events and panels. So stay tuned for a whole lot more. It's going to be a big show, everyone. And don't forget to come back tomorrow and the day after from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. We'll have all kinds of programming for you, including more of the panels that we talked about. Uh, I'm personally really excited to talk about accessibility and tech on Tuesday, so make sure to come back for that. Just about a minute to go till LG takes over. So I just want to say keep sending us your thoughts, and we've loved hanging out with you. Uh, Tell us what you want to see more of. What can we do to better help you engage with CES 2021 and Engadget this year? We would love to know because we can't think of everything, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. If you're out there watching us, if you're an avid Engadget reader, or even if you, you just Sorry, even if you just discovered us for the first time this show, we'd love to know what you think about our coverage, what we could be doing better, what you'd like to see more of a focus on. All that feedback is so crucial to us doing our jobs well, and we would love to learn more about what you think. So I think uh, we'll be kicking it over to LG in a little bit. So once again, thank you. Keep a lot to Engadget. And this has been fun welcoming you to the show. at a time when many of the things we once took for granted now seem like distant memories. Life has changed in so many unexpected ways. While our approach to life may be different now, we persevere. We continue to move ahead, connecting with one another, caring for one another learning from one another. Humanity hasn't changed because our desire to lead better lives is stronger than the forces around us. At LG, we will never stop innovating to bring you more convenience, more entertainment, and more ways to keep you safe so that you can live your lives to the fullest. Whatever changes may come, life is on because life is good. Hello. And welcome to LG Press Conference at CES 2021. And what a special occasion, a CES event, all in the comfort of your own home. But of course, the meaning of home in our lives has changed completely over the past year because working, learning, entertaining, and even shopping from home like never before. Our recent experience has redefined what it means to be at home. And that's why this year, when you say make yourself at home, we are not talking about staying content where we are with what we have. Instead, we're all about exploring new possibilities for all those essential values of home. Ensuring safety with the incredible appliances for personal and environmental care. Improving convenience as you will see with our amazing laptops and monitors. And of course, transforming your entertainment experience through our unparalleled OLED offerings. And all of that is just start, because with the ThinQ app now evolving into a lifestyle platform, we are bringing a whole range of services to help you get even more 
out of our products. So, for the next half hour, we'll be talking you through how we are making sure life is on. Sit back and make yourself at home. Today, we are proud to introduce to you our 2021 innovations that have already won 26 CES Innovation Awards. Every innovation was developed with two key insights in mind. First, how we live in our homes has changed. We aspire for multi-occasional spaces that allow us to live our multi-dimensional lives. Our living rooms are classrooms. Our bedrooms, home offices. And the kitchen is now the creative space for new side hustles to begin. Second, we continue to prioritize and redefine what health and wellness means. We continue to seek peace of mind. So today, more than ever, the foundation of all this is a clean and safe home. It is the air we breathe, the surfaces we touch, the clothes we wear, and the food we keep fresh in our refrigerators. So without further ado, I present to you our 2021 Home Appliance Innovations. We begin with air care, a category that has seen a meteoric rise as consumers prioritize health and wellness and look for solutions that help protect them from air pollution and allergens and safeguard their families and homes. Introducing the next generation of LG Pure Care line, designed to deliver high quality air management solutions and peace of mind for every space. Whether it's at home, a larger commercial space, or personal use when you're on the go, our comprehensive Pure Care series not only meets, but exceeds guidelines for cleaner air. It employs high performance filters and sensor controlled fans to deliver purified air and optimal breathing comfort anywhere and at any time. And we're making caring for your health more convenient with our new line of portable solutions. Like our new category of wearable air purifier technology, designed to deliver convenient personal protection, portability, and peace of mind wherever you go. And our Pure Care Mini, a lightweight, portable air purifier that you can bring with you in your car, to the office, wherever your travels might take you, helping you clear the air and your mind as well. Pure Care joins LG's extensive appliance portfolio that helps make your daily life better and cleaner too. With innovations like our proprietary TrueSteam technology, found in our laundry appliances that are certified to reduce allergens, along with our dishwashers that are certified to sanitize, all while reducing water spots. This, along with our expanded line of Cord Zero vacuums with five-step HEPA filtration that captures 99.99% of dust and dirt. In the kitchen, we're helping keep healthy foods fresh longer with our newest innovations in refrigeration, now available in even more configurations. Introducing the reimagined side-by-side -side refrigerator featuring our seamless InstaView design. Our iconic InstaView door and door technology is bigger and more beautiful than ever. The sleek tinted glass front panel now fully covers the door and is paired with our new flat panel door design for a clean aesthetic. By increasing the InstaView window by 23%, users can see what's inside more easily. With just two quick knocks on the door, the interior illuminates, so you can find and quickly grab your favorite foods and beverages without opening the main refrigerator door. All of this helps keep more cold air inside the refrigerator. And we have a fresh take on the interior design as well. Our new stainless steel interior panels offer a premium look while helping maintain temperature inside the refrigerator. And our advanced linear cooling and door cooling plus help keep food fresher and crisper for up to seven days. We're also providing more usable freezer space thanks to our slim indoor ice maker. All this along with even better organizational features. But yet that's not all. In response to the overwhelming consumer demand for our exclusive craft ice feature, we're also adding that to our new side-by-side -side models as well. 
Only with LG can you enjoy ice three ways. Cubed and crushed in the door, and that beautiful, large, round craft ice made automatically right inside for better tasting drinks at home. And then we've still got more. We've also added advanced cleaning technology. For the first time, we're incorporating the UV technology originally introduced in our water purifiers right into the water dispenser. Our UV nanotechnology automatically refreshes the nozzle, virtually eliminating bacteria by using ultraviolet LED light. Now your hard to clean built-in water dispenser is taken care of automatically. So you can enjoy peace of mind right down to the last drop. When it comes to laundry day, LG is modernizing your space and your routine with the new integrated and intelligent laundry solution, LG's Wash Tower. The sleek single unit is full size and fully featured, all while taking up only half the space. With an exclusive form factor only from LG, Wash Tower features a washer on bottom and a dryer on top with convenient controls, built-in intelligence, and advanced cleaning. Our vertical laundry solution takes up half the floor space of a side-by-side -side pair, giving you the freedom to reinvent your laundry space in your own style. Whether it's adding extra storage, work from home setups, pet washing stations, or an LG Styler steam closet for the ultimate laundry room. Unlike conventional stacked laundry pairs, LG's exclusive center control panel is conveniently positioned in the middle of the unit and displays both washer and dryer controls, putting comfortable access within reach for the very first time. With LG's latest laundry technologies, Wash Tower delivers thorough yet gentle washing with advanced garment care. It can handle ultra-large loads, even a king-size comforter. And with Turbo Wash 360, you can get all of that washing done in less than 30 minutes. We've also added built-in intelligence to take out the guesswork when it comes to figuring out the right cycle. We all know that more than 90% of users are going to select the normal cycle anyway. So we've incorporated built-in sensors that use AI technology to detect fabric texture and load size. It then automatically selects the right wash motions, drying temperatures, and more for precision fabric care. And it gets even smarter Wash Tower will even learn your preferred settings. Simply activate Smart Learner in the LG Thank You app, and it will remember your ideal wash temperature, spin speed, or dry level. And with Smart Pairing, the washer can even tell the dryer the right compatible drying cycle, making LG Wash Tower the ultimate laundry hack. For the millions that suffer from allergies, our allergen cycle is certified asthma and allergy friendly and removes more than 95% of common household allergens from fabrics. LG Laundry and Kitchen Appliances in 2021 also deliver peace of mind with LG Proactive Customer Care. Introduced last year and now offered on even more LG Home Appliances, Proactive Customer Care is an industry-first, personalized customer support tool. It provides installation reports, customized maintenance tips, and monthly usage reports to keep your LG Smart Appliances performing their best and helping you avoid unwanted service calls. Proactive customer care will even alert you to potential issues before they arise so that you can proactively address them. All of this offered at no additional cost. Our 2021 home appliance lineup will take to a whole new level all the essential values of home, helping clean and sanitize, offering convenience and delivering peace of mind. Also, you can spend more time making yourself at home. Whether it's experimenting with new recipes, mastering those DIY projects, conquering a work presentation and laundry all at the same time, or enjoying next level entertainment. Life at home has changed over the last year, and television usage has increased dramatically. We're watching more live TV, streaming more, and gaming more. In light of these trends, 
providing an unparalleled entertainment experience is even more relevant. And nothing does this better than an LG OLED TV. Viewers have always been able to count on an LG OLED for the best experience, no matter what they're watching. And we'll bring even further innovation in 2021. New panel technology, even more powerful processors with AI capabilities, and a completely redesigned webOS user experience. This year, LG OLED will continue to set the standard in home theater picture quality with the introduction of the next evolution of OLED, the OLED EVO, which features our most advanced panel and processor. After OLED TVs were introduced, the first evolution occurred when 4K OLED HDR was launched, providing a new level of realism. Now, OLED EVO, found in our new G1 Gallery series, builds upon that, bringing a new luminous element that offers high brightness, punchy images with high clarity, detail, and realism. The new TV lineup, which includes an 83-inch screen size, will also be equipped with the Alpha 9 Gen 4 AI Intelligent Processor, with powerful upscaling using deep learning, it makes all content look better. It also includes AI Picture Pro, which can detect objects and backgrounds within scenes, process each separately for clearer text and better image rendering. It can also optimize picture quality by automatically detecting content genre, scene conditions, and ambient lighting conditions. The Gen 4 processor also upgrades AI Sound Pro with two major improvements. First, the ability to upmix audio to a virtual 5.1.2 channels, giving an incredibly immersive surround experience just using the TV speakers. Second is auto volume leveling. This innovation solves the annoying problem of varying sound levels when you switch channels or streaming apps. The WebOS home screen has been totally redesigned to allow faster access to the content you want to watch, as well as allowing easier discovery of new content based on the user's preferences. You can now find the programming you're looking for far more easily. Even the popular Magic Remote has been refreshed for 2021 and now feels even more comfortable to hold and use. The button layout is more intuitive and now includes dedicated buttons for ThinQ AI, the built-in smart assistants, and content streaming services for quick access. Some models even have NFC Magic Tap functionality that will provide a fast connection with mobile devices for easier access to a host of exciting new features. For example, just tap the remote to share content from a smartphone to the TV or to watch TV content on a smartphone. Beyond enhanced usability, our latest OLED TVs are sure to excite consumers regardless of what they're watching, thanks to key attributes we like to call the four S's. Sharp, swift, smooth, and slim, which encompass all of the key benefits that OLED offers. LG OLED is undoubtedly a dream come true for anyone who loves cinema. Not only are LG's OLED TVs beloved by consumers the world over, they're also widely used by some of the biggest names in Hollywood and other professionals working in the creative industry. Let's take a look. Hi, I'm Ben Havey, Vice President of Innovation and Marketing Technology at the Walt Disney Studios. I'm truly thrilled to welcome LG to the Studio Lab family. LG is the leader in OLED technology, which is driving a revolution in how we experience content. It made complete sense for us to partner. In fact, I'm standing here in the Soul Lounge, a truly unique immersive experience located in the historic El Capitan Theater in Hollywood, California. Luxurious and exclusive, this lounge is powered by some of LG's most advanced displays and shows the impact that display technology such as OLED can have on the consumer experience of our content. And I look forward to the coming months as we see the creations from our innovation partnership start to take shape. Watching sports on TV is also more exciting when your TV is an LG OLED. LG OLEDs are widely recognized as the best gaming TVs on the planet for both console and PC games. LG's OLED TVs made PC gaming history in 2019, becoming the first TVs to be approved by NVIDIA as G-Sync compatible. LG OLEDs also became the first TVs to support gaming in 8K 60p with G-Sync. We invited some friends to check it out. Roll the clip. Hi. 
never been more excited to do anything. Oh! Are you kidding me? Oh my gosh. Oh my god. No way. This is f***ing incredible, dude. This is amazing. My god. You can see wear and tear on the treads. Look at this. Why is it so detailed? My mind is blown, dude. Wow. But let's see how LG OLED is raising the bar yet again in 2021, to the delight of gamers everywhere. Game Optimizer is a new feature that puts all game-related settings in one place and applies the best picture settings depending on the type of game being played. Settings such as G-Sync, FreeSync, and VRR can all be controlled within the Game Optimizer for an easier way to set up the smoothest, most seamless image quality. Cloud gaming can also be enjoyed on LG TVs in 2021. What's more, LG TVs will also come with the Twitch app. LG OLED TVs have always had slim profiles and designs capable of turning heads. They're endorsed by some of the world's most celebrated designers and design houses. Introduced last year, the LG Gallery Design TV has been described as a thing of beauty. And this year, we're introducing the Gallery Stand as an elegant alternative to wall mounting. Many of the new core technologies and design elements introduced so far are also coming to LG's NanoCell LCD lineup in 2021. While OLED is the champion of picture quality with outstanding precision at an individual pixel level, this year, LCD technology takes a huge leap forward. Introducing our most advanced LCD TVs to date. QNED, which feature mini LED technology and come in ultra large screen sizes. QNED comes with bigger, brighter pictures, better blacks, and better color. The only way for LCD TVs to get bigger and better is for the details to get smaller and more precise. QNED makes that possible thanks to an advanced backlight array comprised of smaller LEDs enabling the use of more individual lights to provide dramatically higher peak brightness. Perhaps just as important, LG's mini LED technology also results in blacks that are deeper and more precise than any of our other LCD TVs due to precision dimming, which can employ up to thousands of individually controllable zones. These TVs can also express a wide color gamut and have outstanding color accuracy. QNED with mini LED backlights will be available in both 4K and 8K series in screen sizes ranging from 65 to 86 inches. As the undisputed global leader in OLED displays, we are proud of our heritage in providing TVs that set industry benchmarks. But it's not all about TVs when it comes to our advanced technology. Let's see how other outstanding innovations make life at home better. Hey y'all, I'm Rhea, a songwriter and DJ, and today I'm so excited to be showing you some of the latest and coolest from LG. Being a musician, you know, traveling is a big part of my life and inspiration, which like so many of you, I desperately want back. So you can only guess how great it was to see this awesome new invention from LG. Chloe bots with UV lamps for protection against infectants. These amazing robots go around high touch, high traffic areas like hotels and use UV light to help reduce exposure to harmful germs. Pathway detection with advanced sensors as well as easy mapping function enable autonomous navigation so they can work all those different rooms on their own and get up real close to furniture and equipment for fast and effective performance. Control is safe and intuitive with built-in safety lock for automatic shutdown when movement is detected and remote updates for monitoring progress. Having said that though, looks like it's gonna be a while till we can have gigs and parties back on. 
So until then, I'm gonna chill in my studio and work on my videos and stuff. Mmm, which is why you see... I could so do with this ultra-light gram laptop. The screen's got larger with 16 to 10 aspect ratio, but magically bezel's gone thinner. So with 99% DCI P3 display and wide quad XJ resolution, it really is LG's premium display at its best. And of course, it looks sharp as ever and feels simply seamless with the hidden hinge design that packs in so much. From fingerprint recognition for simultaneous power up and login, Intel 11th Gen Core Tiger Lake, and a whopping 80 watt hour battery. And for all this, light as ever is this latest version of perfection that is Graham. And speaking of perfection, LG Ultrafine OLED Pro is another masterpiece that brings a whole new meaning of precision and detail. On this beautiful 31.5 inch 4K screen with individual dimming for every single one of over 8 million pixels, and a near infinite 1 million to 1 contrast ratio, you'll be amazed at how a 99% DCI-P3 and 99% sRGB display can show colors as they are originally intended. Real kudos to OLED, right? Well, that's it for me for now, but stay tuned because next up is an exciting update on our beloved LG ThinQ. Over to you, Sam. How was that? I hope you're enjoying the amazing diversity of our product. There is one key concept, though that runs through so many of these incredible innovations. And that is, of course, LG ThinQ, our AI-empowered, IoT-enabled vision for a new future, for a better life. And the hub for all those smart, connected appliances has always been our ThinQ app, which so many of you already downloaded to enjoy enhanced control of your ThinQ appliances. But as you know, ThinQ app has always been evolving, constantly improving with new services like proactive customer care. So today, I am thrilled to share with you that starting this year, ThinQ will take its biggest leap as an intelligent lifestyle platform. The idea is simple. We are reinventing ThinQ app from a control interface to a digital platform for ever-growing range of services and solutions. From an app serving appliances to appliance serving an open platform for lifestyle innovation. And the most important thing about this idea is that it be an open and collaborative ecosystem where we engage with an expanding network of partners to make things more accessible, more convenient, and more useful for our customers. For example, we're going to work with leading food brands like Nestle and Kraft Heinz. So you can purchase their products. When your orders arrive, you can use Scan to Cook to have your kitchen appliances configured with the right cooking setting for what you're about to cook. So you get that healthy, delicious meal with far less time and far less stress. Moving home? Call for home advisor assistance on ThinQ app and they'll make sure your appliances are all ready to go at your new home just a few examples where ThinQ app as an intelligent lifestyle platform will bring a whole new range of services and solutions to help you get more out of your LG products. And of course, this is only the beginning. We'll be adding more partners and services to ThinQ ecosystem over the course of this year. So please, do keep an eye on your ThinQ app. Over to you, JK. So, life is on as we continue on with our journey of innovation for a better life. From the latest in our product lineup to think you app as a lifestyle platform, find out more about these great innovations at our virtual exhibition. There's also a special event tomorrow with our CTO, Dr. IP Park, on the future of lifestyle innovation. So do join us again for that fascinating conversation. With such unexpected and profound changes in all our lives, our hope is that these products and services will not only help you make yourself at home, but also inspire and empower you to rise above the challenges of today. For it is precisely through adversity that we change 
the future of humanity. Thank you for watching. Enjoy your all digital CS. Take care. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Engadget's live coverage of CES 2021 at our virtual stage. I'm senior editor Devendra Hardwar. I'm joined with our senior editor of mobile, Chris Velasco. Hey, Chris. Hey, Dev. How's it going, bud? It's going okay. I love your colorful background. That's going to give me joy all day as we go through all these CES announcements. <laughs> How are you doing? How are you feeling about LG's uh, event so far? Let me tell our viewers here, um, you know, the way we cover CES is a grueling affair, right? We are working the week before, the weekend before, usually at Vegas. Mm -hmm. Now we're doing it remotely. It feels a little different. It's nice not to wake up and trudge to a conference room to go see, you know, LG's press uh, press conference. But how are you feeling about all these changes, V? I so Shalina and I talked about this a bunch when we gave our opening remarks for CES yeah. 2021 a little earlier this morning. But I feel. I mean, look, there's always going to be something lost without the physicality of CES. I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm very much a, a field person. Like, I enjoy events and I'm very good at them. So, so and especially you know, for TVs, right? My, you want to go see them. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And LG in particular always has some of the most ostentatious displays at their booth, right? So, not being able to see that this year does kind of feel like a big loss for the company. Yeah. <laughs> I miss the, the video wall, right? Every year at CES, I think for the past five years or, or more, LG. LG has basically created this crazy wall that's powered by OLED. It goes over the ceiling and everything. You walk through, it's like a tunnel. Uh, we're not going to get that this year, but what we are going to get is a new family of OLED. So they're talking about their OLED Evo technology, which just looks like, you know, better quality OLED, brighter, which is nice because I think as perfect as OLED TVs can be, um, they're not as bright as LCDs. And that's kind of the thing Samsung and other companies have been pushing. You know, if you have a bright living room with a lot of windows or something, an OLED may have a hard time competing against all that external light, whereas an LCD can go, you know, over a thousand nits super easily. So it seems like LG is kind of tackling that uh, with OLED Evo. Do you have any thoughts about this? This is sort of like their their top end OLED, I guess, with the G series. It's tough to say, right? Because I, mm -hmm. I'm very much a practical television person. I have an old 65 inch <laughs> Uh, 4K, I, I think it's like a Le Echo, back when Le Echo was a thing. I've got one of those, mm -hmm. and it works fine. So, you know, going through a lot of these announcements, especially where LG and its uh, displays are concerned, you know, I, I feel like I'm very much the quote-unquote average consumer. I, I understand that things are better, and the things that mm -hmm. are newer tend to be better as well, so I should probably spend my money on those. But but break it down for us. What are, you know, as a, as a sort of regular person, at least when it comes to TVs, what should I be looking for, and what is LG delivering that I should kind of be aware of? I think the thing I'm noticing most about the OLED Evo tech is just that it is it is a slightly more souped up version of what we've seen on the OLED screen so far. Let me tell you, for the past couple of years, the OLED screens haven't really changed that much. The big new thing is HDMI 2.1, you know, which is going to deliver faster data speeds, support for 8K video, and also support for 4K beyond 60 FPS, which is really good for gaming. So last year's OLED TVs, the CX series, pretty they had you know, HDMI 2.1, I've played around with the 48 inch version. That's a great, pretty much perfect gaming TV. You know, it has variable refresh rate. So if your frame rate is not, you know, right at 60 or right at 120, the TV can still smooth out gameplay. So it'll look pretty good. Um, I think this year, you know, the Evo stuff, 
looks fine. It looks very, very nice. I'm not sure between that and like the rest of the C1 series, like uh, I do think like there, there are just more choices this year, right? So if you want a super big one, there is an 83 inch set for the first time. And between what we've seen at Sony and Samsung too, it does seem like big, big, big TVs are becoming a bigger deal now, right? People are at, can actually afford them. They may actually have space for them. Maybe as we're all stuck at home too, they're thinking about maybe I need to really upgrade that 65 inch with something serious. Right. So I don't know, mm-hmm. you know, how big I, I know you have an apartment in Brooklyn V is 65 inch, like the maximum you consider in your space. I, you know, I could, I could squeeze more. Like I, I'm thankful. I'm grateful to live in like an apartment that's like <laughs> decently sized because I do live kind of out there in Brooklyn. So I do. You're have not out there. I, You're not that well, far. <laughs> okay, fine, fine. Yeah. You, you are the New York expert. I gladly defer to you. Um, but yeah, there's definitely room. I could, I could feasibly move up to like an eighty something. But, but you know, again, crazy, as sort yeah. of an average TV consumer, you know, size is obviously a big deal. But do you not face, you know, drops off in resolution at that point? Like, how do you sort of balance the need for a big TV mm-hmm. versus the best picture quality? I think. You know, the thing we're seeing this year, too, is there's a lot more talk about 8K, right? So there are 8K OLEDs, there's 8K LCDs coming from uh, LG. And a lot of these companies, I've asked them, like, what? how do we deal with 8K when there is no 8K content? You know, it's going to be right. years before, <laughs> you know, HBO just went to 4K. You know, it's going to be years before that stuff is ready. And everybody's just really talking about the upscaling and the fact that, you know, you're going to be pretty close to these TVs. So if it's like 80 inches or above you'll probably want something that's maybe a little more than 4K because the last thing you want to do when you buy a $5,000 TV or whatever is to see pixels. You know, if you're sitting down, you're enjoying things, you're paying for a high quality image. Um, 8K screens seem like they're going to be the things uh, a lot of companies are just pushing this year for big screen sizes. And I kind of get that. On the other hand, um, you know, when we were going to theaters, when those things existed, most of the theater screens were 4K you know, digitally projected screens, you know, and you were watching a screen that was what, 30 feet tall. So (laughs) yeah, if I couldn't really tell the pixels there during a movie or something, I think I'm going to have a harder problem at home with a 80 inch screen or something, but that is the big sell, right? If you're going beyond 80 inches, maybe one AK, we're seeing a lot of companies take that seriously. And I feel like that could be interesting, but you know, the overall health of your TV panel, it matters a lot more than 8K, right? So make sure you have HDMI 2.1, whatever you're looking for. Look at your brightness. Look at the technology behind it. I think what's more interesting this year for LE, uh, for LG is that they're actually bringing in mini LED technology into their LCD lineup, their nano cell TVs. And normally, I, th- I think we just ignore those TVs, right? Because they're LCDs. <laughs> they're, they're fine, but... Right. LG has all these OLEDs over here. I'm going to look at the best TVs on the market, right? I'm not going to look at these LCDs. Um, But mini LED is really interesting technology. We saw it last year with the TCL 8 series. I ended up buying one of those. Um, I wrote it up in Gadget, so you can check (laughs) that out. It is a really cool technology, right? Because it's all about solving the backlight problem for LCDs. And the thing is, if you remember... Maybe like 2010, 2012, uh, LCDs mostly had like side lighting, you know, so you would get this weird splotchy gray look for cheaper TVs. Eventually, we moved to full array backlight. So individual zones um, that would light up and give you a more realistic sort of contrast. And that is fine. But the amount of those zones really, you know, you have to pay more to get more zones. Mini LED is all about getting you to hundreds and thousands of uh, LED zones are much smaller now, more localized lighting, uh, so better bright levels, better black levels, which has always been a big problem for LCDs. So I'm going to be really interested to see how well those look, because on my TCL 8 series, it looks pretty good. You know, I didn't want to pay for another OLED. I already have a 50 inch OLED, uh, 55 inch OLED. I need something bigger. For $1,000, a 65-inch TV that had all this new tech was a pretty good deal. So I feel like that's going to be a big thing for LG moving forward. Maybe you'd want to take a look at those too, B. Yeah. Just to clarify, for people like yeah. me, so it seems like the big draw when it comes to I mean, the LED is that they've managed to shrink down the, the LED package itself. Yes. So they're basically Smaller just LED. to squeeze, get a much mm-hmm. more density behind these panels. So you get more control over what's being lit and what's not. Is that right? 
Yeah, pretty much. Um, so right now we're looking at a couple different technologies, right? So there's normal LED backlighting, which is pretty much on all the existing LCD TVs. There's mini LED, which is smaller and can get you a thousand individual lights. There's micro LED. And this is where things get a little funky because that's what Samsung and Sony are really pushing with their giant, um, you know, wall displays. Um, so Samsung had the wall. They have, um, you know, a more consumer version of those micro LED screens coming. Those are basically LEDs that are so tiny they're turned into OLEDs, you know, right? Every individual pixel is lit up and controllable and that's going to be cool. Those things are expensive. Okay, the last time last year when we priced out the wall for uh, for Samsung, that thing was over three hundred thousand dollars. If you wanted a one hundred fifty inch wall, right? So you're not going to do that. Most people, I think, are going to be more into the mini LEDs and what that could bring. So I think for people on a budget, if you have a thousand dollars to spend or less, uh, because hey, um, TCL actually just announced a early in the fall a their six series. Uh, are all mini LEDs. You know, they start at like 700 bucks. You can get a good 65 inch for like 850 from them. That's going to be a better deal for everybody. You know, for somebody who can't afford OLED or doesn't want to make that leap, you're going to have some really good looking LCDs moving forward. So I think you should be excited about that as a like mainstream TV buyer. <laughs> okay. So in the short <laughs> term, keep an eye out for sort of mini LED power TVs, micro LED going to be a while before that's sort of commercially viable for regular right. people, right? Gotcha. I think that's so the main what do you thing. Make, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, I think that's the main thing. But what do you I'm interested in what you have as questions. I know you're you're a tech nerd like me. Hey, everybody watching this, you know, you're probably watching us for a reason because you're really interested in the tech behind all this. We've loved OLEDs for the past few years. You know, if you look back at our CS awards, which uh, Engadget has been handling for a while now, um, our top TVs are usually LG's OLEDs just because they offer the best picture quality, you know, uh, perfect black levels, um, great contrast. I do think maybe the tech is getting LED, uh, LCD tech is getting a little better too. We have more alternatives. Um, so yeah, what is really exciting UV about what we're seeing here? I got to tell you, at least with respect to LG's press conference, I, I think it's important to note that like TVs was obviously a huge part of it, but they also went ham on like a lot of other stuff, right? <laughs> and granted, they're not always things we would necessarily cover at Engadget, right? You like don't want you, the giant robot vacuum? Come on. Well, we're gonna get to the giant <laughs> robot vacuum, but this is this is distinctly a phenomenon that I've experienced moving into my 30s. I really like fridges now. Like I really have opinions about good. refrigerators. Mm -hmm. So just I mean seeing, I. I hear you. Yeah, go ahead. I hear you, V. So what what about these new fridges? Because hey, I'm somebody uh in 2020, I moved from my apartment in Brooklyn to a house outside of Atlanta. And all of a sudden, all these appliances, I'm really looking at the tech behind it. What is exciting to you from what you're seeing? I mean, uh, we're gonna see a lot of sort of interesting smart home development with LG. I do have to say, on mm -hmm. the whole, from what I understand, they tend to be lagging a bit behind Samsung, but that might not necessarily be a bad thing, right? Samsung has its sure. like a long line of family hub TVs with giant touchscreens attached to them. The yeah. many of the fridges that we saw during the press conference today are just nice fridges that kind of get a shout out. So again, like I said, things we might not necessarily cover on Engadget, mm -hmm. but things that still matter to people nonetheless. I do yeah. Let me let me tell you, moving, B, by the way, like yeah. LG has a lead with everybody uh, and appliances when it comes to reliability. And that's the thing. If you buy a fridge, you buy a washing machine or whatever, you don't want that thing to break for five years, right? Or 10 years. And you want to be able to replace those parts easily. That's one area mm -hmm. where Samsung really lags behind. So yeah, LG, when it comes to home stuff, um, you know, look up reviews. Like they're typically better rated uh, in terms of reliability, in terms of, you know, what the value that you get. Was there anything specifically about these uh, fridges? Because I see one with like a transparent window that looks pretty cool. So you don't have to open it to see what's inside. Yeah, we'll see. And like, that's not an unusual thing. LG's approach mm -hmm. to this is having a transparent window. Samsung's approach is to have a camera inside of the fridge that you can sort of view from the external display. <laughs> I, I still have not fully figured out why you shouldn't just open the fridge. I guess if you're really concerned about, <laughs> I don't know, like a, like a it's not great for the environment. or something yeah. setting. But yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I want to turn quickly to LG's, I believe it's called the wash tower. Uh, which is their sort of stacked washer and dryer. And again, things that we normally would not care about at Engadget, but sure. they made a big point of playing up AI 
this year, which is very interesting. We've seen it obviously in the televisions with respect to upscaling and sort of uh, sort of image management. But when it comes to washers and dryers, you typically don't expect AI to play much of a role. But as it turns out, the the wash tower uh, has built-in sensors that use AI mm -hmm. to determine not only uh, the size of your load, but the fabrics that are actually being processed. So if you've thrown That's in nice. a bunch of jeans, yeah. the AI will sort of treat those differently than towels or something, which is Kind of, kind of wild, right? Like the AI invasion <laughs> of the smart home has been a thing that's been in motion for a few years now, at the very least. But you know, sitting here watching these companies sort of unveil the fruits of their labor, melding AR and AI mm -hmm. rather, and hardware, it, it kind of feels more real to me now than ever. What's where do you land on the smart home stuff, Dev? It does seem like it's getting better and better, right? So. The idea of washers sensing the types of fabrics and like, you know, the types of loads, that's something that's actually it's kind of been happening for years, right? They can tell how heavy they are and it'll manage things like that. But specific fabrics, that's kind of new. And uh, I think you, t I, you talk to people and you're like, why would I want, you know, a smartphone connected, an Internet connected washer or dryer? And I ended up picking a couple of those LG units up uh, as I have to, like, build out everything I need for a house. <laughs> and it is nice. It is very nice to just be like working and be like, oh, my dryer is ready, you know, or my washer is having an error or something like being connected to our devices because we rely on these things so much, I think is super, super helpful. So I'm not sure about like the AI sensing and everything, but just having a washer that could tell me, hey, I'm done. Please move me to the dryer until we have a robot that can do all that work for us, you know, or a connected machine that'll just dump it right from the washer to the dryer. Uh, I find that useful. I like having the reminders. Um, yeah, I think people I, I appreciate ask a lot. Real of quick, stuff. sorry. Mm -hmm. um, you, since you are the one person at Engadget who seems to be currently in the process of like putting together your home, you recently moved. Congratulations! And from what we can see, at least, thank you. Your space looks pretty chill. I'm down with it. What what do you think about the idea? What if we turned your home into like a smart home studio where you just like install all of the new smart home stuff and just sort of test it as it comes in? And the benefit is you get to live in a slice of like 2022 right now. <laughs> hey, I mean, that is, I like that idea. Also, that's basically what, what I've been doing because I have like the Nest thermostat <laughs> and everything. So me being the tech guy, I'm looking, I'm finally looking at all these appliance things we normally see at LG's CS press conference and Samsung and everybody and being like, hmm. How can I actually use this in my house? And maybe we can make room to test that eventually. I'm sure my wife will not enjoy all the more boxes, more things that we have to deal with. Uh, oh, but, God. you know, it's kind of exciting. Anything else with LG? <laughs> because um, we normally talk with or we see news from LG Display, which is a, another part of the company. Right. And this is what people should get clear, right? LG Display typically works on the raw display technology. It's the stuff that's years ahead and not quite shipping for consumers. But we see some really, really cool stuff from LG Display, right? We saw the rolling TV um, before through LG Display, before they actually started shipping it. This year we saw, what did we see? A transparent OLED that... <laughs> You could, uh, they could install at sushi bars, so you can actually, you know, have, I guess, a barrier between you and the sushi hub, but also something to watch as you're chowing down on sushi. That looks kind of cool. Any thoughts? Hell yeah, right? Like, it's a sneeze guard yeah. plus display. Like, what is what is not to like about that? Especially practical. <laughs> I mean, look, I don't know when the next time any of us will wind up in a sushi bar will be, but it's good to know that there is something innovation-wise in the pipeline that will help us out once we get there. Yeah. And actually, really interesting, speaking of, of LG Display and sort of the rollable TV, we got our first glimpse of LG's rollable phone, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah, first. Yeah, what do you what do you think? Been, yeah, this has been kind of an open secret for a while. The first, I believe, the first rumblings of LG's rollable phone came from about two to three years ago, if not more. But it's been an open secret mm -hmm. for quite some time. They've been they they've been like cheekily hinting at it for a while too. But you know, LG is a company that, at least in terms of its smartphones, has has not had the same kind of popularity, the same kind of momentum as right. its biggest rival, Samsung. They've completely sat out the foldable race so far, instead focusing on uh, accessories that kind of give LG's existing smartphones a second screen. So you'd have basically a sort of a <laughs> A smartphone and a half, if you want to think yeah. about it that way. 
What we're getting mm -hmm. with the LG Rollable is what feels like a really tremendous response to all of Samsung's momentum in foldable. So if you haven't seen it, uh, you know it's it's available. I believe just very quick looks in the intro and the outro of LG's press conference. But you see someone holding the phone horizontally, and you know it appears at first to just be a regular, roughly six and a half inch smartphone with a six and a half inch smartphone display, but then one side kind of rolls up and kind of gives you that small tablet, which could be interesting for a lot of reasons, right? You're sure. not going to get the crease, no visible crease, uh, which is continues to be a sticking point for people who are contemplating foldables, but maybe aren't sold on, on them yet. Uh, yeah, yeah. And just generally, LG makes good screens. Like, I, I'm really curious to see this thing. Um, LG, as you mentioned, has experience with rollable TVs, so hopefully that expertise transfers over. I'm sure it does to some extent. But that also sure. brings up really interesting questions about durability, right? Because having a hinge in a phone is one thing. Like, it's arguably not yeah. amazing for long-term durability, but it's sort of a known quantity at this point. But you figure if you've got a rollable, there are motors involved, there are more moving parts, there's more complexity. One has to really wonder how viable something like this is in a device that you're going to throw into a bag and probably drop more than a few times. Mm, yeah, or put in your back pocket and sit on repeatedly throughout the day, too. Oh, like, it oh, is it is I'm wild to me. Yeah, you're that guy. I've seen all the phones you've broken. Um, it is wild to me that LG has kind of let Samsung take the lead with folding phones and everything because LG is is the you know source of so much OLED technology, right? LG makes the OLED screens for Sony's TV. LG makes OLED for a lot of other companies. Samsung only uses OLED on its smartphones and um, you know and tablets, right? So they're better with smaller OLED. Um, do you think LG was kind of uh, you know, they announced the Flex. Remember the LG Flex like five years ago? Oh, and do you think they were burned yeah. by that, by experimenting with it? I mean, I will say LG has had a really rich history of just like trying stuff out and sort of brushing it off when things don't work. You're right. The G Flex line, such a great example. It was one of the first cool. sort of curved display phones. And unlike Samsung's curved display phone at the time, it sort of was like, banana shape, so it kind of fit the contours of your face, which was like not a bad idea. The problem is, I'm sure they were more expensive to make, and also, it's not like it's dramatically better to use than a regular smartphone, so they decided no. But um, what's interesting about what LG has done recently with smartphones is they've launched what's called the Explorer program, which is, to my understanding, almost like a skunk works within LG. They'll sort of cook up wild concepts. We saw one not too long ago, the LG Wing, which is like a smartphone that swivels, so you get like a horizontal <laughs> screen and a second screen uh -huh. under it. I we we unfortunately never got around to reviewing it because there was just so much to review in 2020. But mm -hmm. it's it's weird in a way that LG has always been really good at. And the beauty, as I understand it, of the Explorer program is LG does not care if it makes any money off of these things. Like if the wing yeah. absolutely flops, they will continue to just try weird stuff. And weird stuff is what LG does in phones. The G5 the first really, truly modular smartphone, or one of at least, compared to mm -hmm. the Moto Zs of the time. Like, they're, they're not afraid to let it all hang out and just, like, eat S-word if it doesn't go to plan. <laughs> so hopefully, the rollable kind of continues in that vein, right? Like, I love the concept. I have a Galaxy Z Fold 2. I love having a phone that's also a tablet when I need to be, but the execution could be cleaner, and that's what the rollable mm -hmm. would be great for. I just hope it... I hope LG has like the cojones basically to stick with it, even if it doesn't sell, because it's probably not going to sell. Yeah, yeah. Most likely, I feel like 95 percent of the things they come up with just never go anywhere. But hey, that's we kind of need these big companies like LG and Samsung to take those big swings and take those big hits early on, because it's hard to know what's going to succeed. And also. You know, the geek side of me, I wish LG was running like a, a reality show or something, right? Of this Skunk Works <laughs> team, just like every week's like, whoa, well, what crazy idea do we have now? What's going on? A uh, phone that, you know, folds up like a triangle, you know, a phone that flies. I don't know. I want to see that reality show. That's the Project Greenlight I'd love to see because I think that would be a lot of fun just to see a company like LG really dive into a lot of these problems. You know, that would be that would be something. I wish they were doing that with the Skunk Works project. That would be such a great thing to see because LG gets this reputation, right, of like yeah. kind of doing whatever it wants with smartphones. And, you know, sometimes it seems to take feedback and other times it doesn't. So it has this reputation of just being 
kind of aloof and, and ineffectual in some ways. But if we had that reality show, if we had a view into the product development process and seeing how seriously people are taking really weird ideas, I think everyone would walk away liking LG as a company a whole lot more. Yeah, a reality show hosted by that weird CG character they created for oh, the press conference. Oh, my God. So, oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> didn't see this. I, I, I was sort yeah. of watching the stream with one eye and like typing notes with the other eye. So it was kind of a weird, uh, not great situation for me. But when I saw, I, her, her name is Rhea Keen. When I saw Rhea Keen for the first time, I was like, oh, they just got like a cool young to talk uh -huh. about this like UV sanitizing robot for a bit. Turns out she's, she's not real. Like I totally did not pick up on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the she has an Insta account. She is like as yeah. real as like any other young, you know, connected person is. Okay. I believe in her. I, I look, I having been successfully fooled by LG and in fairness to me, right? Like I had this, I had the stream going in a small window. So I, there's plausible deniability. I'm not a complete, uh, human idiot, but credit to LG. Like I did not see that one coming. It still hasn't really clicked for me. that I was not a real person because I, I don't know, like it seemed close enough at, at first glance. And really that's one of the big hurdles for sort of AI influencers and sort of virtual influencers to, to cross, right? Like we're, we're seeing VTubers, we're seeing sort of virtual influencers really starting to make their mark on culture as a whole. I did not really expect or, or understand that LG was kind of working on this, but uh -huh. Hey man, like, Culture is one of South Korea's greatest exports. So if LG can bring this crazy, like virtual influencer stuff to bear on the rest of the world, sure, man, like why not go for it? Sure. I've seen Macross Plus. I know how this ends. I want, you know, I want oh, my yeah, Sharon Apple LG Apple idol. Yes, Sharon Apple. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I think that would show. be a lot of fun. I'm not sure why more companies aren't pursuing this because, hey, it is what all the uh, the anime weebs would really be into, you know, having <laughs> your little idol, um, a social channel or something to follow. Uh, we'll see what's happening with Rhea Keem. Um, any other, we mentioned some stuff and LG went over a couple of things. There was a giant robot vacuum that looks like Ooh. it could be useful for hotels, I guess. Are I don't we, know what are the we plan was there. The same the one I was, the one that I saw and latched onto was the like UV sanitizing robot that Ray Akeem was yes. talking about. But okay, so yeah, that's just like apparently they announced this at the end of last year, and I think it they uh, the original intent might have been for this to be like a restaurant robot that just like right, goes through right. and like sanitizes surfaces, and like when it sees or detects a person, it just sort of scuttles out of the way or, or allows itself to be moved by someone who works at whatever establishment is using this UV sanitizing robot. But uh, look, yeah, sure, uh, LG has had some history with robots, arguably not as much as others, but yeah, I'll take, I'll take one of these. Like I, I, would, I would have this in my apartment if I could. <laughs> uh, I, know I mean, hey, let, let me tell you, Having a robot vacuum is super helpful uh, in, on many levels. If you're lazy like me, but you want your floors clean, I'm glad that those are getting cheap. Uh, I would love to see LG kind of playing more around that space too, because I know they have a couple. Um, we've got just a couple minutes left, V, but I have to ask, like, how are you feeling about what LG is doing this year? And, you know, what would you like to see more from them? You know, they announced some new LG Gram laptops. We don't really talk about those a lot, but they're, you know, they're really light. You know, they're really yeah, big. They're they can offer big screens and they're super light. Yeah. I think more than anything, what I'd like to see is kind of a more cohesive fabric connecting all of these right. smart home devices, which is like, look, I could say that about Samsung too, right? Like they've been at it for years and they still haven't really gotten anywhere. But I think what's really heartening to see about LG in this case, at least, is sort of seeing some of those tendrils, some of those threads starting to come together. They mentioned, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, how their ThinQ app can pair with like your, your appliances. So you can, and this is like a very weird example, but you can I believe order what looked like food packs. I, I might have missed it, but what looked like food packs from Nestle or Kraft Heinz, those are sent to your home. You scan the QR code, and your the app on your phone sends the cooking instructions for that particular food pack or whatever to your oven or your microwave. So, it, like you, you're starting to see LG weave this fabric more thoroughly. I don't think it's there yet. And I think what's really going to be important for the next few years is LG locking that down, at least as best it can. 
Mm-hmm. I'm honestly surprised that LG still has. I'm surprised that LG has so much more to show us. Uh, you know, because we're coming off of 2020, a year when a lot of us were in lockdown, we're not working, you know, in the office, and you know, even even though Korea handled it a better than a lot of other places. Um, I do, sh- I'm surprised like, Hey, LG is still pumping out new TVs, uh, new products, not really important in the grand scheme of things, but impressive, I guess. Um, do you expect them to kind of ramp things up? Um, cause this foldable phone, how far away do you think that is? You know, do you think I that is a year from now, two years from now? I, I have no concrete information, but I, I would be willing to bet that rollable phone happens this year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like end of the year type thing, yeah. Yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah. If <laughs> at at the latest, I this could easily at be the, like a late summer fall release. I could see that happening for sure. <laughs> I do wonder if like our release from you know the pandemic and after everybody gets vaccinated and things are safer, are people just going to go crazy and splurge on like the things that'll let them you know be outside but stay connected too? Because we're not going to want to be stuck inside our homes for much longer too. So it kind of makes sense. That's when LG is really going to get out there with better mobile tech because maybe there'll be a rush on newer, better smartphones, or we're going to be spending more time, you know, using our cellular connections rather than stuck at home using our ISPs. I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, I'm, you know, as our first LG is always our first, CES press conference. And it's a thing where we normally have to like wake up, really get going for the show. And this year, not too many surprises, but I still think this is a good showing, you know, for LG. We're also going to be talking with LG, um, one of their home entertainment executives, Tim Alessi, later this afternoon. So if you want to hear more about, you know, our chats about OLED TVs and, you know, how many mini LEDs are going to the nano cell TVs, stay tuned to that. That's going to be around, I believe, 3 p.m. Eastern. Yeah. Um, cool. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you so much, Chris Velasco. I hope you're doing well. And uh, what are we what are we looking forward to? What is next for us here at the CS Live Show? Well, we're now moving directly into the Samsung press conference. Oh, boy. So this is the one we we always love for. So thank you, everybody, for joining us and enjoy Samsung. Let's see what they're cooking. Hello, and welcome to CES 2021. Lots has changed since CES 2020. Our world looks different, and many of you have been faced with a new reality, one where, among other things, your home has taken on a greater significance. But together, we found new ways to connect. Video calls with relatives, virtual problem solving with teachers, and maybe even reinstating dinner time with the whole family. But what if that home and those technologies in it were actually built around you? At Samsung, we're always finding ways to do just that. And today, we're going to show you how we're building that future. One where you can live better in your own unique way. We think that with the right technology, we're ready for a better normal. Let's take a look. Making better choices for me. Getting better. Take after take. Having better superpower. Or super intelligence. Coming up with better ideas. <laughs> Doing what's better for the planet. So what do you think? Way better. Better than last time. Interacting with my fans better. Making the future simply better.
This is what we envision. Technology that helps you, that works all around you, that doesn't complicate life, but makes it better. Our innovations are designed to provide more personal and more intuitive experiences that express your personality. It's that inspiration and our focus on you that led us to our fridge lineup called Bespoke. We started with a simple idea to give you the ability to change the color and type of your fridge. Custom fit to your lifestyle. Now, we're expanding on that inspiration to bring Bespoke to the U.S. for the first time. Come and see. Mmm, smells so good. Introducing the all-new four-door flex Bespoke. It comes with even more ways to customize your kitchen for both form and function. And Bespoke will be available in North America this coming spring. Behind this door is a brand new beverage center, which gives you quick access to the water dispenser and an automatically filled water pitcher that's ready whenever you need it. The four-door Bespoke comes with a flex zone and upgraded crispers with temperature control. No more frozen veggies because the fridge was too cold. You can store everything the way you need it. Now, today's reality means you need personalized experiences everywhere in your home. That's because your living space has changed. Today, it's a place to talk, hang out, cook, and maybe even work out. We think your TV should reflect these changes too. With the Serif, the Frame, and the Cero, Samsung made your space more personal with bold design, a gallery-like mode, and both portrait and landscape displays. Now with the Terrace, I can sit on a patio and watch the big game or see cinema-quality content in any room with the Premiere. Our leadership in TVs pushed us further to think about how we could innovate with your needs and reality in mind. That led us to the latest breakthrough in our TV innovation, the all new 110 inch micro LED. If you remember the wall from 2018, we built on that vision to create the micro LED. It's pure RGB LED light shows every color and detail that you've come to expect out of Samsung's TVs. But this time, we're going beyond great picture quality. Micro LED's bezel-less design fits seamlessly into your space, and it's just as smart as our latest QLEDs. New features like Quad View allow you to split your screen up to four ways for various content, and it also offers more than 160 free channels through Samsung TV Plus and customized recommendations with our universal guide. Micro LED will be available this coming March to let you customize your living space in a cutting edge new way. What you've just seen is cutting edge tech customizable to your lifestyle. Yet what you also need is personalized services, ones that respond and adapt to your daily routines. Let's see how Smart Things Cooking can make your life in the kitchen even better.
Of course, exercise is an important part of wellness too. Our Samsung Health Smart Trainer is coming to all of our 2021 TVs to make home training easier. Check out what it can do. Are there any special workouts? Pretty neat, right? Oof. I feel like I've done a workout just by watching them. <sighs> Thank you. Don't you just love Bot Handy? See you soon. Now, I'm often asked to explain artificial intelligence or AI. For many years, I would talk about algorithms, machine learning, and even neural processing. It's been a complicated answer for a long time. But today, AI is much more. It's about being more personal and predictive. It's about benefiting you every day by being a core part of the products and services you enjoy. AI is a transformational technology. When AI is involved, it creates something entirely new. So much so that maybe it could breathe new life into, say, the Mona Lisa. What you see here is a neural avatar built off just one image, made possible by AI. And this type of cutting edge technology is coming to life in and around your home. Let's see it in action. Earlier, we talked about our heritage of TV leadership. Well, we're also applying AI to make the content you watch better. That's what we're doing with AI upscaling, which takes HD content on your TV and turns it into 8K quality with our quantum AI processor. AI can also change the way you do everyday chores. Samsung smart washers learn how you do your laundry, giving you customized cycle preferences to make laundry days a snap. Another way we're bringing AI to you is with a cool new home device that I'm excited to introduce for the first time today. CES, meet JetBot 90 AI Plus. JetBot 90 AI Plus uses object recognition technology to identify and classify objects and decide the best cleaning path. It'll clean close to objects like toys, but stay away from fragile items like vases. This is possible with LiDAR sensors for location detection and 3D sensors to recognize even the smallest obstacles. So no more getting stuck on cables or socks. JetBot 90 AI Plus also comes with a camera. So while it keeps your home clean, you can check in on your furry friends too. This is my dog, Toby. Thank <laughs> you. 
Oops, you're making trouble again. Starting to clean. Returning to the station. Ah. I feel kind of relieved now. That was pretty cool. Our smart things pet uses the AI technology, cameras, and sensors in JetBot 90 AI Plus for a first of its kind pet care service. From real-time barking alerts to customized pet services via the SmartThings app. Keep an eye out for JetBot 90 AI Plus coming to the U.S. within the first half of this year. Robots like JetBot 90 AI Plus are bringing next-level AI into your home, maybe for the first time. But this isn't the first time we've shown you robots at CES. Samsung has been continuously improving our robotics, including many types of bot retail, to help assist and guide you in places like malls and restaurants, when it's safe to all be there again. And as for gems, our mobility aid and exoskeleton, you might remember from CES last year, we've made improvements to its wearability and battery efficiency. Today, GEMS is used in clinical trials and pilot programs, and Samsung is continuing to invest in GEMS to bring it to you soon. Robotics combines Samsung's innovative hardware and cutting-edge AI software to create solutions that both care for you and help you along the way, whether you're at home or outside of it. You are at the center of all our innovations. Now, we're going to show you what this looks like in a not too distant future. First, Samsung BotCare uses AI technology to take care of all the little details in your life by recognizing and understanding your behaviors to be a better robotic assistant and a companion. You've been on your computer too long. How about stretching and taking a short break? The conference call is scheduled in a few minutes. BotCare knows your schedule and your habits and can remind you of the conference call you have with colleagues coming up in 15 minutes. Now remember the bot you saw in our studio earlier? That was Bot Handy, a home robot that can both recognize and grab objects, becoming an extension of you in the kitchen, in the living room, and anywhere else you may need that extra hand in your home. Bot Handy, let's show them what you've got. Mm -hmm. 
Bot Handy uses AI to understand objects, like a glass cup or ceramic plate, taking note of their shape and materials to work as your trusted partner. Bot Handy can move around and do things like set the table or put away groceries. It flips the script on what a robot in your home could look like. Good job! So, did you get a good look? Each of these robots are built with you in mind, but this is just a glimpse into the future we see. Robotics and AI adapting to you and helping you do things more easily at home and outside of it. We're hard at work to bring you next generation innovation with AI as the core enabler for your better tomorrow. I think what needs to be addressed first would be inequality. For me, the ideal future is a place where we can follow what we love. I think schools and education um, can learn from the community. Because to see representation of all people gives hope. It's really about um, finding innovations within green technology. Sustainability is at the absolute heart of everything. Before we try to change what we see in front of us, we need to focus on our own personal development. There's so much to learn. Technology is there to help us. Once we know we can follow what we love, that's when the true journey starts. So I think we need to start building and working towards a more sustainable world. OK, so you've seen new technology, personalised products, robotics and AI. But as you've just heard, we need to do more to build a sustainable future. The next generation is asking for us to have a more mindful relationship with the environment, our society and humankind. It's clear that we can't just tackle one or two issues. We need a holistic solution and that's our goal at Samsung. So to start, we've asked ourselves, what have we done so far for people, for society and for the environment? And how can we do better? First of all, we believe in our next generation's potential. They hold the key to creating real, meaningful change in the world. So over the past decade, programs like Samsung Soul for Tomorrow and the Samsung Innovation Campus have incorporated new ways of learning to spark their new ways of thinking. We've worked to make our products and services inclusive so everyone can have access to technology. Features like our automatic sign language Zoom assist those with hearing challenges. And our See Colours app helps those with sight challenges better view billions of colours. We've also helped find ways to stay healthy in our new constantly connected lifestyles. Samsung's digital wellbeing is here to help you take control and better manage your time. Of course, we can't forget about our planet. Today we're building innovative products and technology with sustainability at the core to ensure that the next generation can enjoy a green planet. To start, we've put sustainability at the heart of some of our most popular products. Samsung's AI-powered washing machines optimize water, detergent and wash cycles, saving water and power. Our bespoke refrigerators let you update the design and function of your fridge to respond to lifestyle changes instead of buying a new one. We will even build a TV remote out of recycled plastic that can charge via solar or indoor lighting, reducing battery waste. And our energy-saving memory solutions significantly reduce power consumption. Applying our SSDs and DRAM in all data center servers can save up to seven terawatt hours of energy per year. Enough to power every home in California for a month. 
From education programmes to sustainable products and services, we're constantly thinking of using our technology to break barriers for a better future. And as we look ahead, we will continue to put people, society and the planet at the centre of everything we do. As we think about sustainability, perhaps the biggest challenge facing humankind is to coexist with nature. If we want to flourish, nature must flourish too. And the technology industry has a significant role to play. There is waste around the world from technology and its packaging. The good news? Companies are working to change through reduced packaging and critical programs like upcycling, in which electronics are not simply pulled apart and recycled, but used as building blocks for entirely new devices and services. Samsung's Galaxy Upcycling program does exactly this and reimagines used phones into new roles. For example, last year Samsung created portable eye exam devices with Galaxy phones for organizations in need. The Galaxy Upcycling program has won awards for its innovative approach to sustainability from the US Environmental Protection Agency, among other organizations. It encourages technology to solve our social needs while lengthening product life cycles and reducing waste. It's a recognition of our need to take responsibility and be in harmony with nature. Thank you. How about we take a closer look at another piece of the upcycling program? Last year, Samsung unveiled its eco packaging, where TV boxes were repurposed as small scale pieces of furniture. These efforts won the Innovation Award at CES 2020, and I'm pleased to announce that we plan to use eco packaging in all our TV products in 2021. But we also wanted to find a way for you to play a bigger part in upcycling too. So this year, we'll be updating the software in used Galaxy phones and launching a new program, Galaxy Upcycling at Home. You can decide how to repurpose your Galaxy for convenient home devices. For example, you can upcycle a Galaxy into a childcare tool. Sensors in the phone monitor the audio around your baby and send an alert if it hears crying helping you sleep easy. And your pets benefit too. A Galaxy can become a long distance remote, so you can turn on the lights if your pet is home alone. And with Samsung security features already built in, you can create a digitally safe home too. Through these programs, we want to inspire you to live more sustainably with an easy to achieve, do it yourself approach allowing people who want to participate do their part in helping our planet. I'm so excited to be part of an initiative that is redefining sustainability in tech and the role your devices play today and tomorrow. This is our vision of a better, more inclusive and sustainable future. And we're working towards it every day. What we've shared today is how after a year of abrupt change, Samsung can help us all work toward a better, brighter future through next generation technologies. While Samsung's technologies can help make it happen, it's your resilience, your versatility that will shape the world we live in and make it better 
for generations to come. At our Unpacked event later this week, we'll show you more products that push us toward this vision. And together, we believe we can build a better normal for all. Thank you, and have a great CES. Good morning and welcome back to Engadget's continuing live coverage of CES 2021. I am senior mobile editor Chris Velasco. Really quickly want to take a note to mention uh, apologies for the audio issues we had during our LG conversation. Uh, thanks to everyone in the chat who pointed it out. I would like to blame Skype for that, but that was probably my mistake. Anyway. LG is done. Now the Samsung press conference is done. And joining me to discuss what Samsung has just announced and re-announced in some cases is Reviews Editor Sherlyn Lowe. Sherlyn, welcome back. Thank you. Hi. That was fun. That was fun. There was a lot of fun stuff <laughs> in Samsung's press conferences, and this year was no different. Really quickly, just, just off the top, what stood out for you in this press conference? Um, I think the AI jetbot surprisingly uh, stood out for me. I was also um, taken a, um, sort of by surprise that there was no mention of TVs at all. Um, Samsung has already pre-announced most of its TV news January 6, I believe. So that was last week. But I thought they would at least kind of bring it up, show us some of that. Uh, and to, I, I must have missed it if it had happened. But then there were <laughs> dogs and cats. So... So that was fun. But you saw the JetBot uh, in person, V. Can you tell us more about it? Sure can. But really quickly, I do want to know, Samsung did sort of name check at least their micro OLED TV, the one based on the wall, which we saw at CES last right. year. So they, they did True sort fast. of briefly run through some of their TV innovations. But for the most part, this, this was a very different press conference than LG. LG purely product focus. With this press conference, Samsung decided to take a bit of a step back and talk about its larger role as an electronics provider in a world that is rapidly changing. So yes, uh, to your point about JetBot, though, <laughs> one of many robots Samsung showed off this morning during its CES press conference. I got to tell you, I'm not a robot vacuum person. I, I find a lot of joy personally in just like mm -hmm. puttering around my apartment and making sure it's clean. doesn't happen often enough, but I do enjoy doing it. <laughs> uh, what's nice about the JetBot, as Samsung pointed out, is the, the multitude of sensors and the kind of intelligence behind all of it. So it has a LiDAR for sort of wide range room sensing. It's got a trio of sensors up front and cameras as well. All of these these things work in tandem not only to help the JetBot 90 kind of figure out the best path to clean your apartment, but also to figure out how to tackle some of the stuff in front of it. So if it sees a phone cord or a sock, as they say, it'll see that and decide, you know what, I'm not going to destroy either of those things. I'm just going to swerve around it. If it sees mm -hmm. smaller debris on the ground, for example, something small and round that could look like cereal or dog food, it'll decide to plow right through and just clean up the mess. I will say, when we were talking with Samsung prior to today's press conference about the JetBot 90, they did specifically say that it can identify a, a dog poo and avoid the dog poo. So you don't get a repeat <laughs> of that terrifying YouTube video of a Roomba dragging a poop all over the floor. So there is oh, at least no. that. Uh, I mean, I, I was enjoying this kind of full Western that they had going on with the dog versus the cat. The Jetbot AI was certainly interesting. For, for me, I am like you. I enjoy getting into the corners myself with a mop or even a cloth sometimes and just cleaning it. But this Jetbot does look like it's a lot smarter uh, than some that are out there. I will say there was another robot that uh, Samsung unveiled the bot handy and I was paying uh, attention to our live chat uh, while Samsung's keynote was going on and everybody kind of kind of you know had ideas for what this oh yeah. extra hand at home could do for you but <laughs> 
For the purposes that Samsung says it's for, V, what do you think? Does this seem like it would be helpful or it would just get in the way? I, you know, it's tough to say. It really kind of depends on your circumstances. I, I live alone, so sometimes I feel like an extra hand might be helpful. For, before we get any further, though, I, I yes, <laughs> like, let's just get this out of the way. This thing is called the Bot Handy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. <laughs> way to go, Samsung. Could please work on that. That needs to be addressed. But anyway, uh, really just terrible branding aside, this does seem, if not exactly practical, a step in the direction of practicality. In case you mm -hmm. missed the bot handy spot in the press conference. It is a robot that basically has a tall cylindrical body with a face. Like it'll make cool faces <laughs> at you apparently and a robot arm. But what's really more important than the arm itself is again, the intelligence behind the arm. It uses sensors mm -hmm. and AI to determine not just what object it's being asked to hold, but the material of said object. So it'll handle say a rubber ball much differently than it would handle in this case, a glass or a ceramic plate. In those cases, Mm -hmm. Obviously, you have to worry about pressure and, and sort of balance much more than you would with a ball. So, you know, it, it remains to be seen exactly how well that recognition and that sort of interpretation of the visual data works. We have not seen <laughs> Bot Handy. I can't with this name. We, I, we have <laughs> not seen Bot Handy outside of a very candid demo in this video. So who knows? But it's it's cute in the way that a lot of Samsung's robots tend to be. They also announced the other one, as you saw, the Bot Care, which is yeah. sort of a, a sequel to the version of the Bot Care that we saw in 2019 that functions quite a bit differently. Sherlyn, what can you tell us about Mr. Bot Care? Um, I I'm not actually entirely up to speed on Bot Care, and I'm still a little bit uh caught, like focused on Bot Handy to be honest because. <laughs> I like you live alone and I'm like, do I need another? I, I like doing um, uh, household chores myself because I'm very particular about some of these things um, that the way I would do some of these things, like load the dishwasher, for example. And I don't know that I would trust a robot to do that, even though it might do it better than I do. Um, I would say that like uh, people in the chat, I just want to shout out that we're, we're going to try our best to pay attention to the chat. This is live. We are going to interact with you directly, but we might not be able to uh, constantly be answering your questions, but I will say that um, there's people are already excited at the idea of the jet bot being able to circumvent or go around dog poop and they would buy their own dog poop scoopers. Um, <laughs> bot, the that bot chair check. device though. <laughs> v, why don't you tell me a bit more about it? Because I, I, I oh, got so sure. caught up with bot handy when Samsung was explaining it that I was like, that must have <laughs> just glazed right through. Look. Totally fair. Bot Handy has uh, charming in quite a few ways. Uh, bot <laughs> Care takes <laughs> Bot Care takes things in a slightly different direction. Uh, they originally sort of pegged it two years ago as just like this little home robot that putters around and makes cool faces at you, and, and probably some other things. I'm underselling it here, but this time uh, Samsung is positioning Bot Care as a robot that has a pretty intimate understanding of your schedule, what it is you need to do, and uh, sort of uses AI to remind you of things that might be coming up, but also to check in with you as a person. As we saw in the press conference stream, uh, Bot Care sort of rolled up to a person and said, hey, you've been on the computer for a while. You should probably get up, <laughs> which is a, that's a, that's a reminder that I could personally benefit from very frequently. So in that way, Bot Care seems not to tend to household chores the way a bot handy mm -hmm. might, but instead tries to tend to a person's life and sort of mental state, which does sound kind of nice. It is also I usable for uh, conference calls, as we saw in the press conference. It'll remind you of something like a conference call coming up in your schedule, and when that conference call does come up, its face just like turns into a tablet, and you can see the other person and talk to them via a camera. So if that all works the way it, the way it is intended to, very cool stuff. But again, we have not seen Samsung really provide like a like a proper viable roadmap for getting these things into homes just yet. I I want to say that, um, and I remember seeing the the bot care now now that I've you know got over the shock of bot handy. Um, but a lot of the things that you just mentioned, right, reminding you to kind of get up when you've been idle for a little bit too long at your computer or 
you know, reminding you that an upcoming appointment is five minutes away. Um, those sound like things that a smartwatch could do. So really, I feel like the main benefit here is to have the, the roving conference call screen, which there are existing telepresence robots that already do something like that. And there's the adoption of those still isn't very high. My take, at least, is that a lot of these devices that we see uh, or these robots that Samsung has talked about today will make more sense in specific environments. Like, by handy might be more useful, say, in a hospital next to a patient's bedside where maybe they do need an extra hand uh, getting something that's far away or out of their reach. Or bot care might be able to keep people connected in those you know, patient care environments. I don't know that it's so good for the home use just yet, but there are compelling use cases, I think, for some of these robots. That's definitely true. And it's, I think, perhaps to Samsung's detriment that it only ever really talks about these robots within the context of a home. Because as you point out, bot handy in hospitals would be a great thing. I could totally see uh, something like a bot care being used in sort of a retirement facility or something, just to have you know one machine that can sort of stroll up to you and say, hey, you've got that scheduled call with your granddaughter in 10 minutes. Let me turn my face into a screen so you can talk to her in a little bit. So th these are use cases that have not been really openly discussed by Samsung, at least not within the context of its CEO. 2021 press conference, which is frankly a shame because, as you point out, there's a lot of potential for these robots to do actual good. The fact that they sort of are cutesy and have the ability to just salute you and stuff, like that added bit of right. personality also really helps, uh, especially within certain contexts like uh, retirement facilities and hospitals, like having something that, in addition to being practical and functional, that is also kind of cute and fun, like that's that's got to be good for I the sphere as well. But I mean, hopefully it doesn't annoy the people it's supposed to be tending to. I mean, my grandmother is currently in a long-term care facility just getting over uh, surgery, and I can see this robot being helpful for me, but I don't know how she would take to it just yet. There is a lot we need to know about the implementation here. I don't think we can speculate too much on it. Uh, but Samsung did announce a few more things, uh, and I actually managed to get some hands-on time with one of them, the Samsung Health Smart Trainer. Uh, and I'm going kind of in, in grouping together all the AI-based things because, you know, Samsung did make a big section about its AI stuff. But the Smart Health, even though a uh, Smart Trainer, even though it wasn't part of the AI package, is sort of using AI. So Samsung Health first launched on Samsung's TVs last year, and this year the company is introducing this smart trainer feature, which uses an optional third-party camera to kind of look at you and see how many jumping jacks you're doing, count them for you, and it'll also assess your form. So if you're not really holding your plank right, or if you're not squatting properly, then it won't count those uh, into your, your number of reps required to finish an exercise. Smart Trainer is going to be available with about 24 different workout videos at launch uh, from partners like Jillian Michaels, OB Fitness, Bar 3. Um, so it's kind of limited for now. And based on the presentation that very described by our team, uh, and gadget team as kind of Black Mirror-like, uh, sort of a trailer, <laughs> um, I'm not sure how useful it'll be just yet because a lot of the actions the, the company showed were jumping jacks, squats, and burpees. Uh, I don't know how much more beyond that the company has worked on. I The ones that I tried, the exercises I tried out in particular were jumping jacks and squats. And yeah, it was effective for those, but I'd love to see how this can become a more comprehensive uh, package overall, because I do think that exercise form is very important, especially as we move to at-home fitness uh, during the pandemic and beyond. But V, is this something that intrigues you at all? Look, it is. And we, you and I have spoken a lot about sort of home fitness within the context of COVID-19 <laughs> yeah. quite recently. So this is something that's been on my mind. I am I, curious, though. Like, I... I've got like a little stationary bike. I've got like my apps that sort of tell me how to do things or at least when to do things. But as, mm -hmm. as a person who's tried Samsung's approach to this, which does seem to be a bit more guided, like for me, it depends on how Samsung positions this. If this is something you're supposed to spend, spend 10 bucks a month on, assuming you have a mm -hmm. Samsung TV, like uh, maybe not. Maybe not right, right out of the gate. Right. What's what's your take on immediate sort of viability? Like, would you replace any of your existing workout stuff with something like this? Uh, because the content is so important and the content is so sparse right now, no. Um, and also remember, you'll have to be the one to attach a camera to your TV. So in the demo that I took, it was a Logitech webcam perched on top of the screen. You can connect any, uh, you know, 
camera you prefer with USB, um, but it it does require that additional accessory that not everyone might have, and not everyone is comfortable or wants to have a camera watching them while they exercise anyway. So it's entirely up to you, which is nice. But uh, I, I think it needs to be embedded into more content so far, and then there has to be a bit more of value for the user. Um, and maybe that's you know combined with some sort of personal trainer or software that that makes sure and and in the way that's what the Julia Michael workout is, but more interactive. I feel might be the way to go. I'm not a product designer. Samsung needs to think about how to make this more appealing to the user. Um, so, but mm. Samsung had a lot of announcements, by the way, and we still have about 15 minutes to go before our next thing. So, do you want to go over some of the other stuff uh, that we saw from Samsung yeah. at the presentation? Let's definitely do that. I just want to note really quickly, huh, hmm, Samsung maybe not great at software functionality and design. Who would have thought? Huh. Hmm, hmm. <laughs> I wonder about that. Yeah, they're terrible at it. Um, so, but, but yes, to your point, Samsung has announced a bunch of other things. Really quickly, right off the top, we are recapping Samsung's uh, CES 2021 press conference, during which they talked about you know, very briefly their micro LED TV, sort of based on the wall. They talked about their bespoke mm -hmm. refrigerator, which is... Really cool if you're into refrigerators, sure. but generally not a thing we'd really discuss on a gadget. Uh, to me, sure. some of the most interesting stuff that Samsung got into is stuff that they saved right for the end. They were talking about their sustainability efforts and sort of upcycling, mm -hmm. which which is not mm -hmm. something I expected kind of going into this, right? Like I expected products everywhere, not ways to sort of improve the life of your devices after they've hit their useful life. The most interesting to me, and Shirley, I'd love to get your take on this, is the upcycling for Galaxy phones. This is really mm -hmm. cool. If you have an older Galaxy device, like an old, I don't know, like a Galaxy S7, a Galaxy Tab, whatever, mm -hmm. devices that have sort of outlived their usefulness and are just sort of taking up space in your drawer, instead of letting them continue to sit unused or, you know, worst case scenario, like throwing them in the trash, which you should absolutely right. not do. Please look do into e-waste recycling if you're considering that. Instead of doing any of those things, you can load what Samsung makes sound like new software specifically for those devices to turn them into sort of other internet of things uh, devices. So for example, they use the example they use the example of uh, sort of running new software on a phone and turning that into an audio monitor for your child. So yes, you would probably still want like a traditional like baby monitor, maybe one with video because it's 2020. But if you had the extra phone laying around, you could have that sort of in the child's room and have it ping you whenever it can tell your child is crying. That's the big example mm -hmm. that they pointed out and one that I think a lot of parents could benefit from because who doesn't have old phones laying around somewhere? But I, mm -hmm, I would love mm -hmm. to see Samsung kind of expand this. And I can think of like a bajillion different things I could use my old phones for. Shalin, where are you at on upcycling? Two things, right? The first thing is that you've already said Samsung's not the best when it comes to software and you know, software for products like that. I, I am curious to see how effective this will be. Another thing that stood out to me of the Galaxy upcycling program is the mention of the eye exams that uh, Samsung was able to turn some of these older phones or devices into a you know, portable eye exam tools for 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 company or countries or areas where people need it. Um, and I think that that's actually a better use of some of these old devices. I am pretty, you know, I'm a fan of decluttering. I love to be able to donate some of these older devices to a program like that to hopefully see it go to you know something good. But I will also say that I am a pretty paranoid person who is antsy about her device, like her her information, her data and. I would love to demag something or magnetize something or something like that before I hopefully recycle it in a hopefully like a good way, you know, take it to Best Buy or something like that. But uh, it, it remains to be seen, right? There's not a lot of details out there yet about this program and, and how you would contribute to it, how we use it. Again, I would love to know more from Samsung, but I do think it's good that the company actually spent such a huge portion, to me anyway, of its keynote. Uh, on a topic like sustainability, right? It might, it might sound like just this corporate PR speak where they're trying to make themselves sound good and like, oh, we're doing this good thing for the environment, sure. But it is also an important topic that we do need to pay attention to. And I think that the fact that Samsung spent a certain amount of time on its keynote on such a topic is laudable, even if it makes themselves look good, you know what I mean? 
For sure. Uh, I, I want to continue digging into Samsung sustainability, but I do want to make a quick note here. We've got 12 minutes until the end of the <laughs> session. We'll be moving into a conversation between Devendra Hardwar and Samsung execs to talk about their latest line of TVs. So all of the TV deep dive stuff you're not getting in yeah. this panel, you're going to get in just a little bit. Uh, just because Samsung is like one of two big press conferences we've had at CES so far. That's why we're talking about Samsung and you're just going to, that's just how it goes. I do also want to note that we are paying attention to the chat. If you have any questions or comments that you'd like us to address on the stream, we've got about 10 minutes left for that. So drop them in the chat. We're definitely looking mm -hmm. at that. Uh, but yeah, back to sustainability. The other uh, sort of initiative that Samsung talked about was it's sort of eco-friendly packaging, which they started last year, apparently. And this is not something I've seen because I've not bought <laughs> Samsung TV ever, actually. But apparently if you do, mm -hmm. Uh, all of its televisions and many of its products in 2021 will use this eco-friendly packaging, which is designed to be sort of reconfigured and reused as sort of small bits of furniture, which I, I could see that being helpful. I definitely appreciate the thought that went into it. Uh, Sherlyn, do you, do you want little bits of cardboard furniture in your house after you buy a TV? I think there's a better way. I, I, I mean, I've received packages like that before where parts of the box are meant for you to reuse in your home. And I just don't have room for more clutter. I just don't, I live in a tiny studio. I don't have room. And I, I, I'm not a person who wants something flimsy, like cardboard lying around for a while. I just, I, you know, just put them in the recycling bin and that's how I deal with it. But again, there, at least there's an option, right? At least I can still go to the recycling bin and put cardboard in the cardboard box. And then if not, if you really don't want to repurpose it, I guess it's a nice touch. Um, a lot of companies in the in other areas, like laptops, for example, are committing to things like using ocean-bound plastic or recyclable materials in their products itself. And I think that that might be that might make more of an impact when it comes to sustainability and saving our planet. But you know, this is one way to go, and this isn't Samsung's only way, obviously. So it's it's nice to see one disclosure. We'd love to see more. Um, but there was one more thing, by the way, just on the AI front that stood out to me, uh, not to jump all over I'll the place, V, but, uh, I'll go for it. when Samsung did that neural avatar, right. When it was talking about its AI and it did the, the, oh, the yeah. when its host was, you know, making the same expressions and then the Mona Lisa appeared next to him. And then there was, you know, the same expressions being made and the neural avatar reminds me of the LG press conference that just happened where they had a virtual influencer all together introduce part of its uh, news. <laughs> um, I want to shout out the chat that a lot of people in the chat were saying, plot twist, the host of the Samsung CES keynote himself might have been a deep fake or, or an AI from the very beginning. Now, there was no such <laughs> reveal, <laughs> but that's not, that, that would have been... Yeah, that would have been like a great big surprise if that was the case. I don't think we're that near that future just yet. But what do you think of the neural avatar? <laughs> The neural, the neural avatar is dumb. Like, yeah, I, you can map your phone. Okay? Like, that's not difficult stuff. But you raise right. an interesting point, and the chat raises an interesting point, because last year, did we not see Samsung or an offshoot of Samsung Neon sort of talking okay. about these sort of AI-powered okay. avatars? What if? What if that presenter was a neon AI avatar that could surely explain some of the weird decisions he made <laughs> while presenting this incredibly canned presentation? But uh, I, I digress. I don't think that's what actually happened. I would love so much for that to be the case. Uh, quick note, I, I am seeing some people asking in the chat, when is Sony? Uh, because those people have their priorities uh, Indeed. well in Sony row. is Sony 5 p.m. Eastern today, and we will be live streaming here on Engadget.com as well, and followed by, you know, uh, our Engadget teammates helping you break down some of the news and giving you some color and context behind it, and maybe some additional information, or also just to react to the news alongside you, with you, um, like we're doing now, hopefully. Um, but shout out also yeah, um, asking, to... Yeah, go, ahead. go ahead. What are people asking? No, I was just saying, uh, do they even look at this chat? Yes, we're looking at the chat. Uh, it just <laughs> seems like many of your conversations are happening and they don't really need our, uh, us to weigh in on it, frankly. <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of looking at the chat, uh, I want to call out that Zachary 63L, oh no, 63, said that um, overall, based on this presentation, it seems like Samsung is working for the future rather than the now. I think that's a very you know good observation. It feels like a lot of these technologies are either very futuristic or they're not thinking of people's lives right now, where, where it seems like a lot of these technologies might be a bit extensive, might be a bit out of reach. Um, and yes, there's, there's something about spectacle and something luxurious that's so, you know, 
idea like it's it's like an unattainable thing can sometimes be so great to fantasize about but it would be nice to see samsung do something that's more real estate more practical for the average consumer right i mean the micro led that we talked about uh, that the company announced and we're going to take a deep dive uh into in a little bit that's that's great technology but we haven't heard a price and we're going to guess it's like upwards like tens of thousands of dollars if not more and that's not what you know, people like you or I are going to buy, not to mention the scores of other people watching this stream right now, right? I mean, what do you think? Is, is Samsung working for the future or the now? Samsung always has an eye towards the future, and I appreciate about them. But I do wish, to your point, that they did kind of focus more on the now. And this is something I brought up during our sort of discussion after the LG press conference. Samsung mm -hmm. is a company that might be the best example of having lots of really, really interesting uh, poker is in the fire, right? Like the smart home right. has developed in some interesting ways. The robot stuff is very cool. They're, they're, what Samsung really seems to lack is some sort of unifying fabric that weaves all these things together, right? Like we're starting to see bits and pieces of it. You're able to sort of get notifications on your phone from your jet mm -hmm. bot when it sees a person or a dog kind of doing its thing. You can use said mm -hmm. phone to send cooking instructions from your fridge uh, to your oven so the oven can start preparing itself to cook your food, yeah. I guess. Yeah. There, Samsung is on the way there, but like for so many reasons, and I very strongly believe this has at least part, this is at least partially due to, oh, okay. I do believe this is at least <laughs> partially, sorry, my screen went off and I'm like, is this still going? <laughs> uh, but yeah, at least partially due to Samsung's corporate structure, like there, there doesn't seem to be like an overarching vision that's being put into effect. We're getting a lot of interesting initiatives that sort of kind of work together, but I'd love to see more unification as a whole. And uh, I mean, again, CES being the type of TV focus, home appliance focus show that it is, Samsung tends to focus on these devices. Let's not forget, in just a few days, we will be seeing Samsung again with Galaxy Unpacked on January 14th, where we expect to see things like the latest flagship phones and what else might be you know, cooking over at Samsung. So we will be also covering that event, but I think that's where the company will be you know, showing off its devices, meant for a larger audience than today, but still not necessarily you know, the every person perhaps who is looking for you know, a cheaper phone, maybe this is very likely to be for their flagship S series. I think it's all but known that it will probably be the S21. Um, and, and we don't know the starting price or whatever just yet, but based on previous trends, those have been going and getting more and more expensive. Uh, you know, it'll be nice again to see if Samsung tries to focus on, on, but you know, it's sort of a balance, right? Interesting new features, advanced features, or keeping prices low. This is kind of been the debate for the last year, I feel like. Really great point. I just want to uh, give people a quick note. We're transitioning off the section into an interview between Devendra Hardwar, senior editor, and some Samsung execs to talk through their latest TVs. Uh, monitoring the chat really quickly, there are a few things to point out. Kashyap Koparam very astutely notes that Samsung throws 500 things on the wall and sees what sticks. That's now <laughs> future past in all parallel universes too. You, you nailed it, man. Like that is exactly yep. Samsung's MO. It comes up with a bajillion different things. And if three of them work, eh, that's more or less fine by them. Success. Um, sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I also, this is very uh, selfish, but Brioska says, uh, had nice things to say about my glasses, which is very interesting because Sherlyn, you do not like these things at all. <laughs> I, I I prefer other types of frames, uh, and I, I'm as long as you like them and you're happy, I am happy for you, bro. Right, they're, they're fine. <laughs> well, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I might reconsider, but that's not because of you. It's because of the chat. Uh, speaking okay. Of, well, there you go. We've got people who want to hear about their robots, not TVs, which is great because I would always prefer to talk about Samsung's robots or any I robots instead of TVs because TVs are fine. Yes, uh, we yes. don't need to dwell yeah. on them too much. I think. I, I also want to quickly shout out a lot of people in the chat earlier today, before I think Samsung even, were asking, where are the computers, where are the laptops, where are the PCs, and where are the chips? Those are all coming later in the day, for it's sure, and later during coming. the show. They're coming, just, but just Samsung did announce a new laptop. Um, let me just quickly explain the Galaxy Chromebook 2, by the way, which is a cheaper version of the original Galaxy Chromebook, uh, which, if you recall, was you know announced last CES uh, with a 4K OLED display. and. Uh, $999 starting price. And during our review, we found out it had all together about four hours of battery life, which is 
teeny tiny and nothing. So this year, <laughs> yes, exactly. This year's Galaxy Chromebook 2 will be using a QLED screen instead. It's at full HD resolution and it's got potentially up to 14 hours of battery life. And it starts at a much more reasonable $550 which is still on the pricier side for a Chromebook, but at least not $1,000. So if you want more of the details on the Chromebook 2 and laptops, go to Engadget.com. We, we have all the details for you there. But V, what were you saying before I talked about the Chromebook? Oh, man, I'm just hanging out with the dudes in chat. Suki Singh says, Sony Xperia <laughs> 1 Mark II, best phone for your buck if you're a photographer. Look, man, I love that phone. I, <laughs> it's a phenomenal <laughs> thing. I took some of the best photos I've ever taken basically in my life on that phone. Well spotted. Oh. Some people, Hassan El Agati asked, micro 1080p, sorry, 1080p micro LED or 8K LED TV. Got to go 1080 micro LED because I don't need 8K. Come on. Like, I barely care is a lot. this. And when you say LED too, are you talking about OLED mini LED or, or you know, there's there's a little, I think you're talking OLED and yes, OLED is nice, but you know, micro LEDs are getting us there, but we don't really need that high resolution just yet. We'll see. But uh, we have more of that TV chat coming up with the Vindro Hardware very shortly. Uh, v, did you have any last thoughts from the from the chat? Yeah, no, that's it. I'm I'm enjoying sort of seeing everyone uh, sort of come together and just sort of have a good time in the chat. As Sherlyn noted, we have Devendra Hardware coming up in conversation with Samsung executives to walk through some of the company's biggest announcements as far as TVs go, which we haven't really talked about so far because I don't think either Sherlyn and I are huge TV people. We have TVs that work. We don't stress about them too much. That's it. <laughs> we do really, really want to thank you guys for joining us. This is just the first morning in the first few hours of CES 2021 day one. And I think everything is going pretty well so far. I'm certainly having a good time. What about you, Sherlyn? Me too. And I want to thank people in the chat. Please keep your questions coming. We will be looking at them as much as we can. If you want a direct line, hit us up on social media. I'm at Sherlyn Lowe on Twitter. Chris, you are. I'm at Chris Velasco. I believe we'll be transitioning off into that uh, sort of roundtable conversation between Devendra and Samsung very shortly. In the meantime, we're taking a look at the chat for some last questions. Uh, we'll let you know when we have to switch, but no, we're going right now. Here's Devendra <laughs> and Samsung to talk about all of those new TVs. Enjoy. to call Samsung the maker of the best-looking laptops around, or even just the best-looking Chromebooks anyway. Samsung first wowed me last CES when it introduced the Galaxy Chromebook, which was this sleek, bright red-looking thing that we've never seen from the Chromebook family before, except for maybe the Pixel Book. But this year, the company is following up at CES 2021 with the Galaxy Chromebook 2. Similar to the predecessor, this one has a bright red finish as well in that same really thin profile and a 360 degree hinge. There's also a new gray color option, but instead of costing like $999 like last year's model, the Chromebook 2 starts at a more affordable $549. At that price, you're losing features like a 4K OLED screen or a secondary camera, but we never really needed those features on a Chromebook to begin with. So the Chromebook 2 here really seems like a better mash of features that we're looking for in Chrome OS. For example, that beautiful build, but for $549, the Chromebook 2, the base model anyway, has an Intel Celeron processor, four gigs of RAM, which is about half that of the original Chromebook, which only had one configuration anyway. And you can step it up to the $700 model and you'll get an Intel Core i3 with eight gigs of RAM. Compare all that to the model from last year, which had an Intel Core i5 and eight gigs of RAM with 256 gigs of storage. It feels like a trade-off, but really Chrome OS doesn't need that much power to begin with. Possibly the biggest difference between the two models, and probably one of the biggest explanations for that price difference, is the screen. Instead of a 4K OLED on Chrome OS, we're getting a QLED display here. 
One of the biggest benefits of the QLED screen is hopefully much better battery life. In fact, Samsung's promising up to 14 hours of juice on the Chromebook 2. The original Galaxy Chromebook was notorious for its bad battery life, so I'm really hopeful that this means we'll see it clock longer than just four hours uh, at a time. Another small complaint we had with the original Galaxy Chromebook when we reviewed it beyond the battery life is that the aspect ratio of 16.9 felt a little bit too cramped. Um, the new Galaxy Chromebook doesn't change that much. It's got a 1920 by 1080 resolution, which means it keeps that same aspect ratio. But again, for the lower price, we don't really mind that much. In person, this screen looks really good. Under the bright lights of this demo area, I was still able to see like 4K UHD scenery really well, all the colors popped. This is the QLED technology that I'm familiar with already on uh, Samsung's other Galaxy laptops. So I'm not surprised that I like the display here. The build is still aluminum, but it feels a little bit lighter than before. Because it is so thin, the Chromebook 2, like its other siblings, has a you know, keyboard with somewhat shallow travel, but I enjoyed typing out a few words here and there on it anyway. It was responsive enough and felt fairly comfortable. Another thing I appreciate that Samsung was able to include is two USB-C ports, one on either side, uh, which makes this just so much easier to use whatever your setup is. Like I said before, I've been a fan of Samsung's recent laptops, the Galaxy Book Flex, the Galaxy Chromebook, and so far I'm really liking the Galaxy Chromebook too. We'll have to obviously put it through its paces to see if the new configuration holds up and if Chrome OS really needs a little bit more power. But for now, I'm cautiously optimistic. After the year we've just had, I don't think it's ever been more important to escape without actually physically escaping, which makes TVs like Samsung's new Neo QLED 8K TVs really interesting. They're not just beautiful, they're terribly immersive and they look a little better than before. And maybe more than anything, they're really impressive because of just how thin and sleek and how nicely they can fit into your life. Let's take a closer look. The big draw here is really the design. And I mean that in a very specific way, because if you look at this model, the QN900A, it is basically the same thickness and packs the same 99% screen to body ratio as we got in last year's model. The difference is the LED array inside. Samsung was able to create a series of LEDs that are about 140th the size of a traditional LED bulb, which means you're getting greater control over your plaques, your sort of uh, bright points all the way through, dramatically more control, which does, at least to my semi-untrained eyes, lead to really, really beautiful pictures. Compared to what I have at home, which is not a bad TV, I'm a little blown away. In addition to just building a really beautiful panel, there's a lot of really intelligent stuff going on here. For one, the AI upscaling is pretty significantly improved. I'm told that if you actually had last year's Q900, you will see something out of an improvement this year. And that's mostly because of Samsung's approach to AI. Last year's model basically saw one version of the AI upscaler working across the entire display. So you had one model that handled everything, which makes sense. But this year, Samsung is using multiple AI models to basically improve different aspects of your content based on what's actually happening. So you might have one model dedicated specifically to improving your colors or one to really optimizing this content for HDR or, or noise reduction. By having these multiple models running at the same time, you are able to get some really impressive results. And that's pretty impressive when you consider that last year's results were really not bad by any stretch. You can also actually run multiple things on the TV at the same time. And there are some limitations to that, but still. You can't run, for example, HBO Max and Netflix and Hulu and YouTube on the TV at the same time. You can only run one streaming app, but everything else, you can have up to four sort of source inputs that you run in different parts of the display. Exactly how useful that's going to be kind of depends on you. I'm really not the kind of person who benefits from having a lot of stuff going on in my face at once, but if you're playing a game on your Xbox Series X or your PlayStation 5 and you're really kind of 
need help, you could feasibly throw up YouTube or some other sort of tutorial, Twitch perhaps, and just kind of get you through some tough parts. There are sort of intelligent ways to think about using multiple streams of information at the same time. And really, like I said at the top of this video, chilling with your content is maybe more important than ever. And that's why we're seeing the proliferation of 8K TVs. And I know what a lot of you are thinking, what? Why? Why 8K? Why do we need this? Well, from what I've been able to gather here with Samsung, we're really looking at a situation where demand for TV size is kind of driving content and resolution afterwards. People have always wanted bigger, better TVs that offer more. And because of that, you now have to squeeze more resolution into these panels to make sure that your huge 75 or 85 inch TV looks as good as your 65 inch TV did at the same viewing distances. What I do kind of really appreciate about Samsung's approach here is the elimination almost to a complete degree of the bezels. If you take a look at this high model, this is again the QN900. There's basically nothing around this display, but if you go just one step down to the QN800A, it itself is a Neo QLED 8K display, but it has bezels minimal bezels, bezels that I would never complain about had I not just seen this thing, but it is hard to not be spoiled after looking at something like this. Now, unfortunately, we don't know how much either of these Neo QLED AK displays are going to cost, but we do know they're gonna land in the US in early 2021, roughly the first quarter. And that could be a great opportunity for any of you who have just been sitting on a TV and really itching for an upgrade and saving up while we're all just kind of staying at home to splurge on something really immersive. It is worth noting though that these might not be the most immersive TVs Samsung has to offer. I cannot show it to you, but Samsung has been working on a smaller version of its wall, which is a completely monstrous display that they've scaled down now to 110 inches and they're going to do more. There will be smaller models, I believe 99 and 88 inches. So if you really wanna just kick your entire viewing experience up a level, that might be the way to go, but for now, I can't show it to you. So we'll let you know how it works out down the road. Good news for gamers, Samsung's auto game mode returns because it's basically been on every Samsung smart TV and continues to be so, but certain features like this game bar and the ability now to change aspect ratios within gameplay without having to get up is actually pretty slick. If you're a fastidious gamer and you really care about what you see and making sure you get more of that as opposed to having your stuff cut off just so it fills the screen, you've got options you can switch depending on the game between 16 by nine, 21 by nine, 32 by nine, if that's supported. It's pretty helpful stuff. Although I have to say, not everyone is gonna find as much mileage in this as perhaps I might. And if you really, really wanted to, you could connect a webcam to your Samsung QLED TV and get what appears to be a pretty decent workout. The camera can actually be used to track your motion and tell you if you're doing things right, which is great because as you can tell, neither I nor Sherlyn, who's now trying this, are great at working out. Thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for more of our coverage of Samsung's new TVs and everything else from CES 2021. It wouldn't really feel like CES if Samsung didn't unveil a boatload of washers and dryers and refrigerators and all kinds of home appliance stuff. And frankly, we wouldn't cover most of it here on a gadget because, well, they're washers and dryers and refrigerators and things that we generally don't fuss with very much. That said, we did get a chance to take a look at some of Samsung's new appliances, and there are just a couple I wanna point out as we head into CES 2021 proper because they're not just Interesting, they are potentially very helpful. First up, let's talk about Samsung's Family Hub refrigerator, which is by itself not a new concept. We have seen Samsung smart fridges with displays and speakers and touchscreens and apps for quite some time now, and we're finally getting to see Samsung pay attention to the software on these guys. Apart from this just being a really nice fridge, Samsung has also redone the UI for its family hub interface, which is frankly well overdue. If you looked at any of Samsung's sort of prior attempts at this kind of machine, you would see apps, widgets sort of strewn across multiple home screens, 
it felt sort of like a disorganized phone. But Samsung, I think in this case, rightly has decided, you know what, let's kind of fix this. Once you start downloading apps for your Samsung smart fridge, we will start to see them kind of populating different home screens that are dedicated to specific tasks. One for meal planning, one for recipes, one for media, so you can have your Pandora and your Spotify cooking playlists ready to go. That's made possible, at least in part, by the fact that there is a 25 watt speaker under the display itself that's meant in large part to help you, again, sort of groove while you're cooking, but should help you really kind of get through recipes you've never really worked with before, because as one might expect, Samsung Smart Fridge is not just a fridge. It's also a cooking instructor that you can use by way of a Samsung smart cooking app that allows you to select recipes and have them sent to the fridge. Once those recipes are in place, you can be guided through them just the way you would be if you were watching a YouTube video or if you had a friendly instructor in your home. There are some limitations to the system. For example, you cannot add your own recipes to this app, which seems a little silly considering just how many recipe cards people generally have floating around, but that's just not in the cards right now. It's a closed ecosystem by Samsung's own admission. But if you've never cooked before and you really just kind of need something to help you get going and frankly have a lot of money to burn on a really pretty fridge, this might be an interesting way to go. Beyond that, the Family Hub fridge has basically all that you'd expect from a smart fridge. There's an internal camera to let you know what's happening with your food and your perishables whenever you need to without having to open the door. Oh, and not for nothing, but if you really, really wanted to go deep on the Samsung ecosystem and trick out your entire kitchen with Samsung smart connected appliances, there are benefits to doing that. I definitely see the appeal of being able to tell your phone to turn your oven on while you continue your prep elsewhere. Maybe your fridge is telling you how to cook stuff while your oven's going. And look, this is all getting a bit wild. I don't know that this is the future any of us really wanted, but it's here if you want it and can afford it. I also want to take a quick look at Samsung's JetBot 90 AI Plus. That is the full name. It is not a great name, but JetBot, for our intents today, is a really interesting little smart vacuum. Thanks to a LiDAR that sort of emerges and descends back into the body for general navigation and a trio of sensors plus extra cameras, the JetBot is able to identify objects in front of it that are uh, that can be as small as five millimeters. Now that intelligence, as I understand it, is powered in part by some of Samsung's work with Intel. All of that sort of machine learning identification, that visual recognition is all happening on device. The real draw here though, is you have a intelligent autonomous vacuum that can sort of putter around your home and make decisions about what to do with what it sees. If it, for example, identifies something quite small and sort of serial shaped, that's a pretty clear indication that the JetBot should be able to just plow right through, pick everything up and get back to work. That said, if it runs into something that is uh, bigger and creamier and perhaps more poop-like, that would be a clear sign that the JetBot should not roll through it because the last thing you need is poop smeared through your house because of your robot vacuum. Exactly how intelligent this vacuum is kind of remains to be seen, especially because we have not seen it in action, but it does kind of seem like Samsung has really interesting bits cobbled together in a body that is not for nothing pretty stylish and ultimately kind of sounds like a great way to approach home cleaning. There's a lot more coming out of Samsung's news and CES 2021 more broadly, so thanks for watching, stay tuned, and we'll show you everything else this virtual weirdo show has to offer.
guests, Samsung, and the rest of the TV industry show up to show off their latest toys. And that's no different for CES 2021, even though everything is virtual this year. So joining me from Samsung is Mike Kadish and Dan Shanazi. Thank you guys for joining us. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Yeah, and we're going to be talking about all, all the cool new stuff, but I think the thing I'm most excited about from Samsung is the new micro LED sets the, that are going to be available to consumers. This is a sort of sequel to the wall, I guess, or a more streamlined version of the wall that set you guys announced a couple years ago. That's a giant micro LED thing. It's panels, you know, you place on the wall. Um, this is something you guys are positioning as something that people can buy in stores and set up on their own. Can you guys tell me, um, yeah, can you give me a briefing? What is up with these micro LED TV sets? Because I find them really interesting. The wall yep. required professional installation. Yep. I'm wondering, like, how will people go about even getting these into these into their homes and setting them up? Yeah, great question. So back in 2018 at CES, we introduced the wall. Uh, it was our B2B offering. It was modularized, so you could get professional installers to come in, uh, com combine the different modulars into one large uh, display. Uh, now we're, we're excited to show that in 2021, uh, the micro LED is coming to consumers' homes. Uh, we're offering it in three distinct screen sizes, an 88-inch, a 99-inch, and a massive 110-inch solution. Uh, as I said, all of them pre-configured for consumers. You can take it out of the box, install it yourselves. You don't need gotcha. professional installation to come. Is it, it, is it? Are they going to be individual panels that you kind of piece together Lego-like, or is it going to be one consistent thing and you just find a way to put it on your wall? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll take that one. Unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. it, it's a it's a single unit, which uh, okay. which makes installation quite simple. And to your to your uh, early, your first question uh, about ease of installation, um, you can think of the original wall as sort of a, a Lego set, if yeah, you will. Yeah. You had to put it together, and it was about a a three or four day project for a professional. Uh, <laughs> this is you know all all in a frame. It's it's you know there are adjustment points, of course, but uh, you know it's framed and it's ready to hang on the wall. Gotcha. And just to refresh for our, you know, readers and listeners here, um, everybody, you know, when you talk about micro LED, uh, this is a new technology that kind of combines what we really like about OLED, like individual pixel based illumination, um, but without some of the downsides of OLED, right? Um, is there anything that's super different between the wall panels and these consumer micro LED sets? Are we losing anything here? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, it, it's actually the, the technology is quite similar. This is an emissive technology. Mm -hmm. uh, so the 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 actual micro LEDs are, are, are each one is, is represents a pixel. So you have mil, you know literally millions. Um, so technology wise, it's the same uh, because the sizes are a little smaller. The dot pitch, uh, the space between the pixels, is a little bit smaller. So it's a little mm -hmm. bit higher higher detail actually. So very very similar. Um, you know, like it's uh, B2B or business to business counterpart, what we call the wall, the wall lux. Um, you know, this one's easy to install. Uh, and it also has what we call uh, a one connect box. And this is where you make all of your connections. And, and that was, um, you know, that was a carry through to from our from our 8K TVs. Very, very simple. One single fiber optic uh, connection uh, between the, the box where you make all of your AV connections and the actual display. Gotcha. And since this is, I assume, going to be a very, very thin, you know, display, how are you guys handling sound for this? Because it's already a problem for, you know, OLEDs and other TVs as things are getting thinner. These things are basically just flat panels. How is, yeah, how is sound working out here? Yeah, we are bringing a, a new object tracking sound pro functionality. Uh, so the consumer can watch the display and they'll experience kind of a realistic sound that's aligned with the picture that they see on the screen. Mm -hmm. But is the sound, is it coming from behind the display or is the display itself a speaker like we've seen on some OLEDs too? It's coming yeah. from behind the display. Right behind, behind the, the display. display. Yeah, it's, gotcha. it's quite fascinating. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wish I was actually able to test this out. One thing I remember seeing when the wall, uh, when you guys first announced it, is that you could actually kind of make out the lines in between the different modules and the panels. Is that a, is that a concern for these TVs or does it look like a single uniform you know, screen? Yeah, it looks like a single uniform screen. Um, there are, you know, it's it takes a lot of technology to actually design this and to make it, you know, the color and the, and the vibrancy. But 
there's a lot of mechanics involved in this as well. It's it's pre-aligned from the factory, so don't you know don't you know don't think you have to <laughs> spend hours aligning this. But there are adjustments. So you know if there, mm-hmm. if any of the panels are out of alignment, they could easily be adjusted. It's actually adjustments on the side, the top, mm-hmm. the back. Uh, it, it's it's very very simple and ingenious actually. Is that something a consumer would be able to do, or do you have to like call Samsung and get some warranty repair or something if no, things get out of it, alignment? It, yeah, it could be done by a consumer. It's it's quite simple. Uh, just need mm-hmm. a small screwdriver. But again, I guess the point is this is this is pre-adjusted. Uh, yeah. These are only yeah. touch up touch up adjustments uh, if necessary. Gotcha. Can you guys tell me, so just back to the setup part, because I feel like that's what a lot of our readers, you know, and viewers are going to be interested in here. Uh, typically, when you buy a big screen TV these days, right, you take it out of the box, you flip it on a flat surface, and you pray that you don't damage the screen, you get the stand installed and everything. How How is that process going to work here? Do you have to do anything special because this is an entirely new type of display tech? Yeah, you w- you wouldn't flop this on its uh, on its face, so to speak. So it's a little mm-hmm. bit different in that regard. Um, I, I actually I had the, the the I was able to see the actual setup of this in person mm-hmm. uh, just just right before New Year's, uh, and it's quite ingenious. So you know it comes shipped. It comes in a you know in a, in a box vertically. You sort of open it up, and it, it sits in its cushion on the bottom. Uh, and then as far as you know, the logistics of of hanging this. You know, it does come with a mount. Um, you can sort of think of uh, a very clever mount. Uh, you can you can use a visa if you want, but you could okay. also use the included mount, where it just kind of if you lift it up and it clamps on. And let me let me explain. You know, the lifting process because it's a it's a yeah, rather large yeah. large display, and it it was quite ingenious how they they came up with the you know tools and to make it easier to install. So as you'd imagine, this is not a one person job, <laughs> not with a hundred and certainly not with a hundred and ten inch display. <laughs> so there's little detachable handles that can go left and right. So you. You, you, you put your wall mount on, uh, you, you put on the detachable handles left and right. Uh, so you'd have two people, probably one person on the bottom supporting, gotcha. perhaps even a fourth person to make sure the cables, you know, are, are being fed properly. It sounds uh, almost like you're moving a pane of glass, I'd imagine, because glass holders, they have to hold this, those things with special handles. Yeah, right? it's not, it's not, it's grabbing the side, uh, mm-hmm, if you will. Mm-hmm. So there's a left handle and a right handle. So it's attached to the metal frame in the side and you're just simply lifting it up and, and, and hanging it like you know, kind of like a picture frame. Gotcha. And does it have to be hanged, or is there a stand that you can attach these to as well? Uh, There's the, a stand the, option available yeah. that will be sold separately. Gotcha. We, uh, we presume mm-hmm. most consumers are going to want to mount them on the wall, but uh, there will be for those consumers that want to put it on a a console. Uh, we'll have a stand available. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have the dream of mounting my TV, but I also have a toddler. So it's like, it's tough to even like make that time happen. <laughs> a stable stand still works really well for me and a lot of consumers. Um, you know, just about this tech, by the way. Uh, so I assume this goes up to 4K. Does, what does it support when it comes to HDR? And does it support HDMI 2.1 and all the good stuff people want to see in TVs these days? Yeah, it's got it's got all of those features. Um, this one actually has six HDMI's, which is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, HDMI 2.1 is supported. HDR, HDR 10 plus. Uh, so all, all the latest bells and whistles are are supported, and it has our top of the line uh, video processor as well, which I guess would you, you'd expect uh, of a display of this type. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, I mean, I've asked you guys, and I've asked Samsung about this before, because we see OLED screens on Samsung mobile devices, on tablets and phones and everything, but TVs, you guys never quite went there. Is this is this a thing you're betting on instead of OLED? And can you tell me specifically, you know, why that reasoning is? It, this is certainly the, the future of mm-hmm. our displayed vision. Um, Dan mentioned it earlier, the self-emissive uh, technology uh, it doesn't run into some of the the potential pitfalls you have with organic products. Um, also, you know, each pixel uh, is an LED, uh, and with that, you can control uh, to the pixel what image comes out of that. And as a result, you get uh, great contrast, uh, great colors, great picture quality. Gotcha. And are you guys supporting, uh, I assume 4K at this point, but are you going up to 8K with these sets? Because I know the wall can do 8K at this point. Yeah, these are 4K dis- uh, displays. Gotcha. Gotcha. And actually, just thinking of 8K, I remember the wall 8K, you know, the giant size you guys announced last year at CES. That seemed really impressive and everything. And I feel like a lot of TV companies are talking about 8K as this next great thing. 
for me as a consumer and somebody who covers this industry, it just seems like the content's not there. I don't know why anybody would pay for one of those TVs. Do you guys have a sense yet of, you know, is this going to be a more, a bigger year for AK or is it really, we're waiting for that content to appear? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think the answer is twofold. From a content perspective, more and more content is becoming available. Uh, you saw some uh, gaming systems launched just recently that support AK content. Sure. Um, more and well, more they support the content that doesn't exist, right? They yeah. support AK for when it yep. comes. Yeah. So, so I think the, yeah. the ecosystem is there. I think more and more content is coming. We think 2021 is going to be prime time for uh, 8K and the premium segment. Having said that, just as importantly, though, is as screens get bigger uh, mm -hmm. and we talk about going from, you know, a few years ago, 65 inch was a big screen TV. This year, it's going to be all about 85 inch. Um, and as the screens get bigger, our ability to upscale any content, whether it's SD, Full HD, 4K into 8K uh, is going to make uh, make the difference when you're viewing it on such a large screen. Gotcha. And one of the cool features um, that I've read about with these new uh, micro LED sets is that you'll be able to watch up to four different sources of content at once with uh, multi view. Can you guys just tell me how does that work? Because is it only content that's at different inputs or, you know, can you just sit there and launch different streaming apps that you already have baked into the TV? How is that set up? Yeah, I can, I can take that one. So mm -hmm. what we can do, we can do a few things. We can turn, because it's 110 inch, we can turn that into the largest, if we do split screen, would be four 55 inch, uh, you know, uh, diagonal uh, images, which is still on 110 inch. That's pretty crazy. massive. Yeah, yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, we have six HDMI. So, you know, you can have, in theory, you could have, you know, the streaming app plus, plus you know, an external streaming app or, or uh, you know, anything that you can feed in through HDMI plus streaming. Uh, gotcha. So multi-view works based per input, right? So if you're streaming the Netflix app on the TV, you need another box to stream maybe Hulu, right, into into another input there, right? Yeah, if, 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 that, was your, if that was your desire. That's correct. Gotcha. Would it be, just thinking about this feature, because I think fewer people are actually buying set-top boxes now because the TVs themselves are so capable, would it ever be possible to have just Netflix and Hulu and, you know, Amazon Prime or something, all the apps are already baked into the TV running in those separate multi multi-frame panels? Yeah, that's yeah. It would be it would be possible. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not sure you'd want to watch them all at the same time. It's it's challenging. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You could. It, it it would be possible. Gotcha. But you you guys aren't launching with that right now. It's based on per inputs. Okay. Per, per input. Yeah. Well, gotcha. You know, yeah. I'm one streaming of, plus plus uh, physical input. I just yeah. think of uh, that scene in Back to the Future too, where you know I think that was the most amazing thing uh, I remember seeing in the '90s. So it seems like we're kind of getting there. That's pretty cool. Um, and you guys also mentioned something thing about ambient mode, which turns these TVs into wall art or something that blends into your wall. We saw this with the frame from Samsung. Is it the same basic, you know, idea and technology behind this? Yeah, same technology, same idea. The With the frame, however, you have access to our art store sure. and a curated collection of over 1400 images uh, from famous museums around the world. Ambient mode is something we've had for the past couple of years where um, you can set the display when you're not watching the TV to display an image that helps it blend in seamlessly with the rest of your wall. Gotcha, gotcha. And yeah, anything else you guys want to add about these micro LED sets? I do think they're really you know, interesting sounding and compelling. Do we have a sense of availability or where the price ranges are going to fall yet? Yeah, we're really excited to bring these to market from an availability time perspe availability perspective. Uh, it'll be in the spring time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, and pricing, we haven't announced pricing yet, but as we get closer to launch, we'll we'll announce that information. Gotcha. I feel like that's going to be the big thing just because people are, we're seeing big LED screens kind of fall in price. So I've seen 75 inch sets under $1,000 now, which is insane. But also OLEDs, people will still pay a little more for a higher quality screen. So yeah, kind of wondering where these things are going to sit. Um, but talking about LED, by the way, what is up with the QLED sets? Because you guys announced that these are going to have a new light source that's a little smaller. Is this mini LED? What's going on there? Yeah, this is our Neo QLED, mm -hmm. which we're launching this year. I'll let Dan talk uh, the details in a bit more. But uh, sw simply put, we're upgrading the viewing experience from current QLEDs to our Neo QLED TV. This technology uh, is based on a new light source, mm -hmm. uh, and it'll be available on our 8K 
and step up 4K QLED products. Uh, Dan, if you want to provide a bit more background. Sure. Yeah, I can jump in a little bit further. So it's, it's it's mini LED technology, but okay. it's, you know, as you'd expect, Samsung has further refined it, uh, you know, versus competitive offerings. Um, so one, uh, the, the, the package, if you will, the mini LED package, of course, it's small mini, right? So it's 10 times, uh, we can pack 10 times more uh, LEDs into the same space. Um, but the benefit, the consumer benefit for this is going to be the elimination of what they call haloing. You know, when, when you, mm -hmm. figure, you know, think of a, you know, a, a dark sky with a star, right? And it's just a little bit of a halo around it. It's, you know, to some purist, uh, that's that's concerning. Yeah. You know, with this technology, it, it, it would it would almost negate that completely. Gotcha. Um, and that that was an issue because backlight amounts were just really hard. You know, it was really hard to stuff in a lot of backlights into LED sets. The mini LED, from what I remember, it's basically allowing for more light sources and more localized light sources, right? Yeah, it's more light source, and it's also more directional, uh, okay. if you will, as well. So, you know, generally, it's a, a large dispersion of light that comes from the, the backlight, uh, the LEDs. Uh, behind the panel, and this is very, very narrow in focus. So you have more of them, and also more narrowly focused. Mm -hmm. um, we also have um, much better control over that light as well. So we have actually ten, uh, twelve-bit luminance control, which is which is pretty, pretty amazing. Huh. Um, so you know, again, the darkest detail uh, will be seen and appreciated on the new Neo QLED. Yeah, and Dan, you mentioned that you guys are doing something different that competitors aren't with mini LEDs. I actually just picked up a mini LED set last year, and I've been really impressed with it. What are you guys doing differently? You know, what is Samsung adding to this technology that more? Yeah, you know, we're going to see more companies adopt at this point. Yeah, so it's 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 the actual construction of the of the mm -hmm. mini LED as well. So it's 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 the narrow focusing of the light that's going to make a demonstrable difference uh, versus uh, competitive offerings. Gotcha. And, um, you know, as we round things up, I know you guys mentioned that um, there are a couple other new features coming this year to your TVs. There's Google Duo integration, which seems to be working with screen mirroring from your phone to your TV, but also some TVs will have cameras that you can actually put on. Can you guys explain a bit more about that? Yeah, so uh, 2020 has changed us all. And if, yeah, if yeah. your household's anything like mine, we've had more video calls this year with friends and family than we had, or last year, than we had in the past. And my shoulder's a little sore from holding my phone up in front of me <laughs> uh, to have those video chats. But um, thanks to our partnership with Google Duo and Logitech, uh, we'll be uh, offering a third party, the Logitech video camera that can be installed um, separately. So it's not pre configured, not the TV doesn't come with it installed. Mm -hmm. um, consumers can uh, buy it separately, install it, uh, or plug it into the TV itself. Uh, click on the Google Duo app and seamlessly have video conversations with friends and family from uh, the comfort of their living room, looking at a, a giant big screen instead of a small mobile device. That's pretty cool. And which TVs will support this integration? Uh, that's going to be all of our QLED TVs. Gotcha. So not the micro LED stuff coming. I need to double check on the yeah. check on that. We'll yeah, check. Uh, yeah. I guess you, you may have trouble mounting a camera somewhere on that micro LED set, but yeah. okay, that's pretty cool. And one other a little tidbit I saw is you guys announced something called Super Ultra Wide Game View, which lets uh, a TV give you the same basic, I don't know, viewing angle as a super ultra wide monitor. I'm actually using one right now on my PC. Can you guys just give me a sense of how that'll work? So does this mean, you know, just portions of the, of the screen will be blacked off and you'll get a wider, yep. you know, kind of a wider aspect ratio as you play something? That's exactly you know, right. I can, yeah, I can, ahead, that's right. Um, we now have support for 21 by nine or, or even 31 by nine aspect ratio. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's uh, many of the popular PC games uh, will support wide aspect ratio gaming. Uh, so if you do connect you know, play those games on a PC, that PC connected uh, to your TV, you can enjoy a much wider view. So you can see, sure. you know, to the left and to the right, uh, more detail than you could if it was just a, a 16 by nine image. So it's a, it's a, a more immersive uh, experience. For sure. I definitely like playing a lot of PC games there. I guess you will be sacrificing a bit of like vertical, you know, screen space to make this work, right? Yeah, you'll have a, a, a black and a black border top and bottom, but that's yeah. inherent in the, uh, the, the, the video image. Sure, yeah, and sure. additionally, we're introducing something called a game bar, uh, mm -hmm. which will be able to fill up some of that black space that you just referenced, which the game bar can provide information 
that lets consumers monitor and adjust critical aspects of their uh, gaming uh, that they're actually playing, uh, such as input lag, if they've got a headset connected, what the different aspect ratios are and such. Right, frame rates, frame rates as well, if HDR is mm -hmm. on or off, what the aspect ratio is. So, you know, to, I guess to the casual gamer, maybe those aren't so exciting, but for the people that are really immersive into games, those are very important things to know. Sure, I'm definitely, I'm talking to people who want to put TVs, you know, on their desks at this point to do their PC gaming. So I guess we're kind of getting there as a market. Um, just kind of to round things down for you guys here, you know, we're entering 2021. 2020 was a crazy year for all of us, um, but especially it seemed like home entertainment became a more important thing to a lot of people because we couldn't really go anywhere. How is Samsung approaching 2021? And are you guys putting more, yeah, you know, more of an emphasis on home entertainment and what you guys can do to help consumers who are stuck at home? Yeah, definitely. You know, um, consumers have missed out on so many experiences in 2020 uh, that they're used to. You know, people aren't going to movies. All the, the new releases are being launched on their uh, streaming apps. People aren't going to restaurants. They're ordering in and eating with their family in front of the TV. Uh, so what we're trying to do in 2021 is make life easier for consumers because a lot of the things that uh, consumers have done in the past, we think some of those are going to stay. Uh, consumers aren't going to all of a sudden go out and uh, <laughs> uh, be in, with crowds of people uh, anytime soon. So we're trying to develop and provide solutions that make consumers' lives easier. Um, you know, consumers are, they're not going out to the gym anymore uh, as much as they used to. So we're we launched with our launch of Samsung Health and our smart trainer. Uh, consumers can work out from the comfort of their living room and get feedback on the poses and positioning and the number of reps they're taking and have a, a holistic dashboard of their health uh, right there in, from, in front of them. Uh, consumers aren't going into the office to work anymore. Uh, we're introducing something called Remote Access Plus that allows consumers to connect to their office PC directly from their TV. They can also access uh, Office 365 documents directly from their TV as well. So there are a bunch of things consumers aren't doing anymore that they used to a few years ago. We're trying to make their lives easier and let them do those things at home from their TV. Great. Well, thank you so much, guys, for giving us the rundown and all the Samsung news. We've been chatting with Mike Kadish and Dan Shanasi from Samsung. Stay tuned to Engadget.com for more news from CES 2021. We'll have a lot more on TVs, home entertainment, and PCs. And if you dug this video, be sure to like and subscribe.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really glad that we are able to get together today, virtually, of course. It would have been even better if we would have been able to meet in a usual, personal manner at CES. But we are not there yet. Everyone can stay safe, yet connected by using digital and remote tools for communication. Although with the help of virtual reality, it's possible to experience the spirit of CES in Las Vegas. Because our business is digital, the topics we have today are also all digital. This is an ideal medium. I was proud to be part of the announcement at CES 2018 when we launched our MBUX infotainment system, which was first introduced in the A class. Since then, we have consistently made it even better. In September, we launched the latest generation of MBUX in our all new S class. Now we are giving you the latest development in its evolution and a major highlight of the MBUX hyperscreen, which made its digital world premiere just a few days ago. The MBUX hyperscreen will be introduced into a completely new fully electric EQS luxury sedan due out very soon. To show you the MBUX hyperscreen highlights, we have put together a clip for you from the world premiere together with our CEO, Ola Kelenius, and our advanced experience designer, Vera Schmidt. So let's have a look. A warm welcome to our very first world premiere in 2021 and a happy belated new year for Mercedes-Benz. At Mercedes, we will do what's in our power to make 2021 an outstanding year in the most positive and most progressive way. The MBUX hyperscreen is the center of attention, the center of control, and of course, the center of entertainment. And it is the biggest screen ever mounted in a series built Mercedes. You don't search for functions. They will find you. The screen appears lightweight, almost floating in the center of the car. That said, we thought we'd take it to where it belongs. Ready? Welcome to Zero Gravity. Hello everybody and welcome. Allow me to introduce the hyperscreen. To me, it's a milestone in the merging of analog and digital design. This is a jewel of the interior and a true work of art. Three separate screens beneath one gently curved glass surface. It looks and feels like a single entity. This is the futuristic design of the pure EV mode and its different interpretation of displaying key functionalities like boosting, recuperation, or G-Force. We call the G-Force element the EQ Puck, or Flying Saucer. And key information is easy to understand and nice to look at. For me, the hyperscreen's clear minimalist design and strong anchor points make it intuitive and straightforward to use. Now let's have a look at what's inside. The MBUX hyperscreen reinvents how we interact with the car. It's stunning on the outside, super intelligent on the inside. It's a nerve center that connects everyone in the car with the world inside and outside. What you see behind is what makes the, this new level of user interaction so special. Our goal was to create a UI that gives our customer direct intelligent access to all the functions they need in any given situation. In other words, customer-centric user interface. 
It was important for us to create an interface that shall not add distraction or complexity. The result is the next level of fully intuitive user experience. The Hyper Screen offers amazing functionality. You have apps, vehicle functions, navigation, climate control, and entertainment. The list goes on. We call it Zero Layer Principle. It brings all the apps and functions into the fluid, proactive user interface. You can activate the functions you need from one screen. The all important navigation map is always visible in the center. Beneath it, there are controls for the phone, entertainment, or the features that suits the specific situation. The system knows what you want and need, and you know what? That's why the Zero Layer is based on emotional intelligence. The system learns with AI and adds more individual functions on the top as it's required, or places them in the background if they are not being used. In this Zero Layer of Hyper Screen, MBUX also uses AI to process data sets such as position, temperature, and time. Its intelligence also assists you with the route planning and charging to help you get most out of your electric mobility experience. Lots of innovation is focused very much on the driver. But MBUX has something more for everyone in the car. There are innovations for all passengers, but especially for the one in the front because the front seat passenger has their own screen incorporated into the hyper screen. We call it co-driver display. And they can also see all the relevant vehicle information. And there is even more in store for passengers. There are entertainment services with market specific features. At the front seat of the passenger can share content with anyone else in the car. In some markets, it's even possible to watch the TV. On one side of the passenger car, passenger can see and watch the videos while traveling by using the Bluetooth headphones, while on the other side, intelligent camera-based locking concept prevents the driver from looking at the passenger display to avoid distraction. And before you feel too sorry for the driver, they get a pretty attractive view too all by less distracting. It has an exclusive EQ design and the same easy to use interface as it was introduced with the S-Class and together with the full augmented reality. So just to round it off, the hyper screen is a natural progression of the MBUX, taking it to the next level of sophistication and ease of use. The principle of the zero layer is a completely new and super intelligent way of achieving seamless human-machine interaction. And the innovative use cases enhance the EQ experience for the driver and all the passengers. This is customer centricity and digital thinking of 2021. There you have it. The best of featuring the new MBUX hyperscreen, making its debut in the upcoming EQS and later coming to the other Mercedes models. This is a fascinating piece of technology with many great new features. Before I go, I want to show you one cool new feature that will also be the part of the latest MBUX generation. As a working title, we call it Mercedes travel knowledge. But you know what? You can believe me that our marketing is already working on a fancier name. But let me try now. Hey Mercedes, what can you tell me about this building? The Stratosphere Tower is one of the most famous landmarks of Las Vegas and has been for many decades. The rides and attractions on the top of the 350 meter high tower are quite spectacular and especially popular. Thank you, Mercedes. So as you can see, our system is smart and it works in most of the major cities of the world. 
This new MBUX feature evaluates the map material and supplies the appropriate information when the driver or passenger asks for it. The information then appears on the respective displays. Well, as long as I'm here virtually, maybe I'll go to play the slots for a bit. That's a safe, solitary activity, right? So stay healthy and see you soon. I'm
Welcome back to our live coverage of CES 2021. I'm Greg Migliori, Editor-in-Chief of Autoblog. We're here to talk some cars. Joining me right now is Terrence O'Brien, the Managing Editor of Engadget. We just saw a pretty big reveal there, the hyper screen. I almost want to call it the hype screen because it's such a big deal, I think, from Mercedes-Benz. This is the latest evolution of their uh, very sophisticated infotainment system. It's going to stretch all across the dashboard, all, all across the cabin, really, 56 inches. It's one of the biggest, I think, dashboards and electronic uh, infotainment systems we've ever seen. Everything is integrated into it, except the vents, which are functional, and even they look pretty good, I think. Uh, so, Terrence, when you look at this, I mean, do you think this does enough for them? Is this enough, big enough of a step forward? I'm pretty excited uh, just watching the reveal today. Uh, it, as we know, Mercedes always has a very big presence at CES, but I'm curious your take. Do you think this really you know, lets them compete with Tesla and some of the other uh, infotainment systems out there? I, I mean, I think so. I'm, I'm gonna be frank here, not gonna pretend to be an expert on infotainment systems necessarily, but, uh, you know, I've been covering CES for, I've lost track of how many years, I think this is year 12 now. Um, this is easily uh, the most futuristic looking infotainment system I've seen in a car that will actually come to market. Uh, they said soon during the press event, they didn't give a specific date, but we are expecting sometime in 2021 that the uh, hyperscreen is going to end up in the EQS uh, luxury EV. So, you know, that's pretty exciting, um, you know, especially a, a guy like me who's primarily used to dealing with like seven inch resistive touch screens in his dashboard. Yeah, I think that's a great point. The EQS is going to be Mercedes top of the line electric sedan. The S in sort of the uh, the naming scheme coincides with S-Class, which is, of course, their big luxury liner. It's always been the flagship Mercedes sedan. So the EQS is going to be the flagship electric uh, sedan for them. And I think that's entirely logical to launch something like this in a vehicle that is so critically important. You know, this is really becoming a trend in the industry. Uh, Cadillac, which I think we're going to hear a bit more from tomorrow, is going to launch, uh, you know, another sophisticated screen in the Lyric. They've also rolled out several screens in the current Escalade, which you can actually buy now. Uh, the screens kind of vary a little bit in application and the different technologies they use. Uh, the Cadillac one, for example, uh, has several OLED screens, which is what we're going to see here in the in the Mercedes application. And I think it's really, it's an interesting way to sort of bridge, you know, what we're seeing in like TVs, laptops, it's just the general consumer electronics industry and bring it into, you know, the inside of your car. And I really think that's 
the way the future is going to be here at this point. You know, Tesla was one of the pioneers uh, by basically putting, you know, this like screen in the middle of the Model S that really looked like at the time we just called it like an iPad. Um, but it wasn't really well placed. It did feel a little kind of like clunky. And for a while, that was almost the way car companies were doing it. They were like, hey, let's take this touchscreen, you know, whack, put it right there in the middle and, you know, add all that functionality. Uh, what I think is cool about the EQS application and the Cadillac and a few other ones is it is so well just positioned and integrated to really be part of that experience. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about it. It's a curved dash, which it's interesting, you know, when you look at that panel, that's a really old term in the car business. It goes back to like the 40s or 50s. Oldsmobiles used to have curved dashes for entirely different reasons. Uh, but it's interesting just to see that sort of shape kind of is, you know, sort of repeating itself in a, in a far different application here in 2021. Uh, you know, it's also a good way, I think, to rethink the interior. Traditionally, even the dashboard like above the instrument panel, above the controls, you had a lot of leather, you had stitching, and frankly, a lot of just empty space. By making this stretch all the way out, you're making it feel more like organic and I think connected to the car, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, you know, we'll see. The way these things usually work is they're available on like the top end trims. So you do have to pay a good deal more to make sure that you get this, um, which is always tricky. Uh, otherwise, like the base EQS, if you will, would probably have a more simpler system. Uh, that's what I think Cadillac is going to do as well. So, I mean, I'm excited to see this type of technology uh, grow in the auto industry. I think we'll see it more in the luxury sector, too. I mean, that's that's one of the big I'm questions to for me is do we have uh, any idea how much the EQS is going to cost and how much this is going to add to the price of the vehicle? Um, you know, a 56 inch OLED screen in your car, uh, it can't be cheap. There's a reason why most people don't have 60 inch OLED screens in their uh, living room right now. So wondering how much that's going to add, but I, I assume the EQS is aimed at people for whom price is no object, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you would sort of, again, make that sort of parallel, if the S class is Mercedes most expensive sedan, and you know that car is not cheap. And then if you add some electrification to it with the EQS, I, I don't. Th I think if you can afford the EQS, you can certainly afford the uh, you know the screen, the hyper screen, if you will. I think you know what's kind of cool too is just how colorful and futuristic it looks. Because sometimes when you're in the market for an electric vehicle, you I think by nature, maybe not at this point, but just in general, electric vehicle buyers are early adopters. You know, they're people who want to try a different technology. They want to get away from filling up at the pump and they want something that's new and different. And sometimes you would get into hybrids or even full electric vehicles. And it often seemed like the dashboard didn't match like the under the hood battery technology. And I think that's really cool here that, you know, with the EQS and some other vehicles, it seems like the inside is catching up to the outside. Yeah, and I mean, I think just going back to the point you made earlier about uh, Tesla being the, one of the first to integrate this, and I think uh, Mercedes' current MBUX uh, system is still that sort of like seems like an iPad slapped in the middle of the seat style, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I uh, I've tested so, a yeah. number of Mercedes vehicles over the years, and it does have that kind of almost like like Garmin feel. Like, hey, you know, you bought this thing at Costco, and you're going to slap it in the middle of your car. Um, Mercedes has some of the nicest interiors, I think, in the business. So, you know, the way I look, you know, maybe five, 10 years out of the future, you'll be able to get a sophisticated, like all, you know, digital screen like this if you want, or maybe you'll be able to get one that's like halfway screen and then halfway more structural with like leather and stitching in more hard points like that. I think they're going to play to a number of different markets. And, you know, that makes sense. You know, that's how Mercedes has been in business since like, like 1886 or something is they know their customer. They're not afraid to take risks and try new things. And, you know, especially for a brand like them, there is always that risk of, you know, having a luxury car that does seem a little like, you know, stuck up or something. I think the EQS is going to be a vehicle that's legitimately cool. And, you know, as we look at like, 
electrification as it becomes more broadly, you know, available, not just Tesla and not just like the Chevy Bolt and, you know, the Nissan Leaf and things like that. You know, you're going to see like electric vehicles just become cooler and become the norm. And, you know, I, for one, am excited about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited about that, too. Uh, you know, I, I'm the kind of guy who's normally a relatively early adopter. I am not when it comes to automobiles, though, um, for a number of different reasons. But I'm definitely excited to see electric vehicles pick up a more, uh, like, like you said, cool vibe. Try to put out uh, a little bit of a less granola um, image to themselves. I, I am wondering, though... Uh, you know, is this going to be the way forward as well for lower uh, level vehicles? It, do you see this like wraparound screen technology coming to more mainstream sedans or is this going to be the sort of thing that is primarily relegated to the high end stuff for the foreseeable future? You know, I would probably put that at maybe six, seven years out before we start to see like even mid level applications of these. But you never know. Um like Ford rolled out uh, Sync, which was actually kind of roundly criticized because it didn't work very well about 10 years ago. And they put that in everything from like the Fusion, to the Taurus and the Explorer. And that was certainly a risk, you know, going down that road with like mainstream vehicles. Um, I think right now what you're going to see is maybe these really high end uh, curved dash, curved glass panels is sort of like the add on. So you want to get the tech package. Okay, that's an extra couple thousand dollars. You go with that. But then if you're willing to pay maybe even more, hey, you could get this really sophisticated dashboard. And I think that's that's usually how pricing strategies break down, even for luxury automakers. The trick, too, will be how much does development cost and how much does that become you know, democratized? How much do, do suppliers sort of learn how to make this stuff maybe cheaper? And that's when suddenly – You'll start seeing this, you know, more commonly on like Chevys and Nissans and more mainstream vehicles. Uh, ultimately, that's usually how the industry goes, is these really sophisticated, expensive technologies start with the luxury brands, because that's really where you can charge more money. Nobody would question saying, oh, hey, the Mercedes electric vehicle costs this much. People might question if you were trying to charge that much for a Chevy or a Toyota. Uh, so like you, I'm, I'm really curious to see what the pricing is going to be. But, you know, at the end of the day, we already have a lot of this stuff in cars right now. You know, it's just bigger and you could do more stuff with it. So so we'll see. I mean, artificial intelligence, stuff like that, you know, that's something Mercedes touched on today that will sort of learn as you like do certain things, make certain calls at certain times. I think that's cool. Um, and I think people are going to start demanding that too. So, you know, we'll see. Yeah. And I'm, I'm interested to see how that works out in, uh, you know, practicality, how that shapes up in day-to-day -day life. That's one of the things I'm more interested to see, uh, come to the consumer level as well. You know, I don't personally need a 56 inch wraparound screen in my car. Uh, but if my car knows the moment I get in it on like, Sunday afternoon, I'm going to the supermarket, pulls up uh, directions and maybe my shopping list and has it ready to go for me. That's something I'd be kind of into. Uh, but I will I will admit that I am slightly skeptical of that promise. Um, you know, Google and Apple have been talking about putting that sort of stuff in your hand on your phone for years. And uh, it works OK, I think. It's uh, a little hit and miss at times. Yeah, you know what's interesting about that? I think and this is perhaps the challenge for car companies as well as tech companies is where do people want this type of service? Do you want it on your phone? Do you want it on your car? Um, what works better for you? I mean, I don't know about you, but whenever I go somewhere, I still more often than not just throw the, you know, the address in my, like in my phone and roll from there. You know, I, I love testing cars. I love testing out infotainment systems, but it's tricky sometimes to figure out how to use them. You know, sometimes I forget how to use the infotainment system in my own car. So I think a lot of times what, you know, we'll see, and I think that will help determine where the market goes 
is how does the consumer want this? You know, I mean, barely 10 years ago, people were still printing out maps from MapQuest because that's what the easiest thing to do was at your office, you know, and everything literally changed overnight with Apple Maps, Google Maps, things like that. It became just so much easier to do it on your phone and keep things, you know, just taking you where you want to go. And there's certainly a big market out there for, you know, other companies, you know, can you partner with, you know, like a grocery store that will already have, you know, your list curated for you and ready to go? Could you partner with, you know, like a headphone company that might want to sell you some advertising, you know, is like, you know, pre-roll before you even get in the car and you hear your directions. So to me, the car could become like the next frontier of advertising. You know, I hope it doesn't look like, you know, some of those like soccer jerseys you see on European teams, but I mean, Honestly, it could be the next frontier. And when you see technolo technology like the hyperscreen offering all sorts of possibilities, you know, to me, it becomes more of a question of not if, but when. I, and I guess I want to I do want to take one big step back, uh, just because this is actually something I've worried. I've wondered about um, as a more casual car driver, car owner. Um, what is the market like still for these customized, uh, you know, infotainment systems? I'm a guy who gets into his car, plugs his phone in, and just uses Android Auto. Um, and I don't think I've ever actually interacted with the well, like built-in Subaru infotainment system, whatever it's called these days. So it really is sort of like, you know, a case by case basis. I mean, some people, I think if you own the car and maybe the infotainment system is why you purchased it in the first place, or one of the like key considerations, then you do learn to adopt and use it and probably enjoy it. Uh, but I would venture to guess most people get in cars, even cars they own, and still just throw out their phone. Because usually when you're like, before you even make the decision to leave your house, you know, especially in this like pandemic environment we le we live in, you're probably figuring out what route do I want to take? You know, is it busy at that point? Should I go right now? Should I maybe wait a couple hours? People are already making those decisions on their phones. So I think really the automakers that can win and the electronics companies can win are the ones that find that middle ground and how you smooth the transition into your car. Uh, and that's why I think Apple CarPlay and Android Auto were, you know, really successful, especially when they launched. They still are successful because what they did is they just made the solution simpler. They didn't invent a new solution. They just made it easier. They made your life easier. That's all part of it. So, I mean, the hype screen to me is sort of like it's almost like the highest evolution of the dashboard. Uh, we'll see if that, frankly, is what people want. It might also become like. You know, I mean, BMW rolled out a thing where you could like sort of twirl your fingers and that would change the radio or turn the like your audio up on your, you know, in your radio. And it's still in cars. I test drove a BMW a couple of weeks ago and it was there. And I thought to myself, I don't think people really want this. It's easier just to turn the knob. <laughs> so, you know, it, you know, part of the, the hyper screen, too, though, is aesthetics. It really looks awesome. I mean, I'm sure you've watched the video a couple of times like I have. I think it it looks great. It's the kind of thing that even if like I think a lot of it is going to be like dead space too. Like it's not a hundred percent. Like every inch of it is as you you know hit something and it does something. But you know aesthetically, it's going to look beautiful. And it, you know the other thing too is like, will it be distracting? I don't think so. Automakers have generally found a way to make it so these things aren't, especially when they're saying that they're going to go into production. Uh, but you know. We'll see. Yeah, that's that's always my big question too with these things. Um, having a giant screen in my face uh, seems like it might be a little bit problematic when I'm trying to keep my eyes on the road. Um, it seems like they're putting a lot of thought into how to minimize the distraction, but some of the graphics they showed, uh, especially the one um, that appeared to be like a UFO flying down. Uh, trying to destroy the Death Star or something. I, I was confused as to what that visualization was all about and why it would be front and center in your dashboard. So, yeah, I'm right there with you. I couldn't, don't have the faintest idea what they were going for with that. Uh, but one thing I did like, and this is pretty common right now uh, on a number of luxury vehicles or even 
many cars in general, is like the, the dual gauges right in front where it's like you see the tachometer, the speedometer, and you can customize it. Um, I think that's a really good feature because it's just like it's right in front of your face. It's circular. It does look like traditional, if you will. And I think that's really just, you know, a nice experiment or a nice sort of experiment in this like, you know, pretty groundbreaking, you know, play for them. So, you know, we'll see. I think, you know, sometimes when you take steps like this, where you really advance technology, you want to go like give people something that's comforting, but also, you know, put the big screen with the UFO landing over here and then right in front of you be like, Hey, here's the, the speedometer, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm interested to see, uh, again, what it actually will look like. I, I agree that like dual um, meters thing, like being able to customize that and have that information right in front of you uh, seems super useful. Uh, you know, I'm, again, a guy who's only recently upgraded to like a modern vehicle. I was driving like a 20, uh, a 2006 Scion until like about two years ago. Um, All right. So <laughs> this is uh, a lot of this is all fairly new to me, but it is very exciting to see how quickly it's advanced. Um, and yeah, I, I, I do want to see like the actual production, like get behind a wheel, be able to dial up what I personally want to be able to keep my eye on um, and then put it where it would make the most sense. I think that's the the like selling point to me is the customizability of it. Um I one of the things like if my on my old scion the speedometer was like in the middle of the dashboard it wasn't behind the steering wheel um and that was like a thing that was distracting. I didn't know why it was there. It meant I had to take my eyes off of it. Uh whereas in my new car there's limited customizability, but there is a screen and I can choose what that screen behind the steering wheel displays. And this is clearly like even far more advanced than that. So that's like the thing that gets me as a more casual driver. It's interesting because car companies, especially the luxury space, like when I think of Mercedes, I tend to think of what are, you know, what are BMW and Audi doing? And Audi rolled out a digital cockpit that was, geez, this was probably five, six years ago, at least seven years ago, even. And it's slowly rolled out across their lineup. And it's the same idea. It's just not quite as extravagant, not quite as functional as this. Um, although it can be when you like really add in all the different options and different things. Um, and that to your point, Terrence is it's configurable. If you want certain things to be here, you can, if you want certain things to be over there, or in the case of the Audi, you could turn things off, which I think is kind of a nice, nice feature as well. It originally rolled out on the Audi TT, I want to say, which is a sports car, which they actually no longer make, which shows you how long this technology has been around in some cases. Um, and the idea was if you wanted to have a really simple experience in your sports car, you could do that. Um, and I think, you know, in certain cars, like, you know, say a Ford Mustang, um, even the new Tesla Roadster, you're going to want a very minimalist experience. You're just going to want to be able to have like the, like the performance metrics in front of you and maybe the nav screen and that's it. Uh, and I think when you look at vehicles like the EQS, which, you know, as I was looking at some of the electric vehicles they're planning to roll out, like the E line, if you will, we know about at least three of them. And the S is going to be by far the most expensive. And we expect the hyper screen is going to be sort of like an option on top of that. So you're really talking about the top of the food chain here. Um, we've heard about an EQA, an EQE. Uh, which sort of like, you know, stretches the lineup of Mercedes, like traditional cars. They just have like the EQ designation at the front of it. So, you know, again, I think it's good to point out that a lot of the hyper screen is, you know, really at the top of like the tip of the spear, to use that cliche, if you will. It's something that you're not going to see on every Mercedes electric vehicle, but after a couple of years, they're going to start to use that technology, roll it out across more of the EQ lineup. And then, you know, who knows, maybe we'll even see it in some of the regular 
the, the regular Mercedes, if you will. So, you know, I'm excited to see what direction it goes. I think, you know, again, they really put a lot into this that I think takes Mercedes to a place that's a little bit farther than they've traditionally gone. And I think that's really smart right now as an automaker. You don't want to just look at like, even just traditional applications like electrification and infotainment system, and how could you optimize your fuel economy and your traditional like internal combustion engines, and then just design. You want to think, what's next? What else? And for me, that means taking places like, like the interior, the infotainment system, the the dashboard, it completely reinventing it and making it something that really just is special, different, and even a reason you might want to buy the car. I don't, you know, interior is definitely, it should be a strong purchase consideration for people. And I think it is because it's where you spend all your time. But I would venture to guess most people buy a car or many people buy a car simply because of how it looks when you're sort of making that calculus. So, so we'll see. I mean, I think Mercedes, you know, the press conference was pretty short. I mean, it's a virtual show this year, so that's, that's okay. I feel like maybe if, if the show is in person, they might have, you know, drawn it out a little bit more. And that's, that's okay. It's, you know, 2021. But they have, they've invested in CES. You know, they showed that Avatar concept a year or two ago. They traditionally have just brought something to CES to let the world know that they're there. Uh, not every automaker has done that. And I think that's, that's smart. They are getting their brand, the idea of what a Mercedes can be in front of, you know, all sorts of different customers, you know, and I think that's a really smart move. So. Uh, and I mean, forgive me, but I'm not 100 percent up on this, but uh, usually Detroit Auto Show shortly follows CES, right? That's right. I think, uh, you know, usually it's right now. In fact, I was just thinking to myself, it's a little odd not to be getting ready for the, you know, the Detroit Auto Show. And it's. Um, obviously not going to take place this year until I think the fall. Um, as a journalist, I've actually enjoyed being able to focus just on CES this year as opposed to like essentially watching, monitoring two shows. And I'm sure probably the automakers and tech companies feel the same way, actually. It's, it's kind of good to have that more precise focus, if you will. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in a lot of times what we've seen the last couple of years is – Car companies would sort of have to make a call. What do you want to show at CES? What do you want to show at Detroit? What do you want to show at New York, which is only a couple months away traditionally? Usually it's in March or even early April. The Los Angeles Auto Show oftentimes was in late November, early December. So there really was this just like back to back to back, like cadence of auto shows. And then with the pandemic, they've all sort of paused, if you will, until you know, at least probably the summer or fall. Um, the Detroit show did move first to the, the summer, I think, and now they've moved to the fall again. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's that's kind of life right now in 2020, 2021 is all plans are pending. Um, but one thing I think automakers always did a good job of doing with CES is they would take something that maybe might not play at a traditional auto show, like something that wasn't a working car with four wheels and like an engine. And then they would roll it out at CES and say, well, check this out here. It was a great place to gauge reaction, a great place to try and get people to think differently about their brand. And I think that's always a good thing to do. You want to have a philosophy where you're bringing in new customers, attracting new types of people to think about your car company in a different way. So from that standpoint, you know, CES seems relatively quiet this year for, from an automaker perspective. So from that standpoint, I actually kind of applaud Mercedes for having something and showing it and having us talk about it. I mean, that's, that's, that's a good thing, I think. They're raising the conversation. Yeah, I mean, that was one thing that I did notice going into the CES. Over the last couple of years, CES has kind of morphed into – uh, an auto show in a lot of ways. A lot of companies rolling in with, like you said, these high concept, maybe not going to be available uh, immediately or ever things. And then this year, a little bit quieter. Uh, they stepped back, um, which I guess isn't terribly surprising, seeing as how we can't all be there to test drive their weird concepts in person. Yeah, I think it's, uh, 
my is just an auto journalist. I think I kind of enjoy that they're pulling back a little bit from CES to give it, I mean, to give us a breather. But I think it also made it uh, a little easier to sort of differentiate like what they're trying to do, what their mission was. But I will say this, a few years ago, there were multiple like like crazy far out things like Faraday Future and Neo, um, a lot of companies that it, have some fun, you know, Googling and seeing what they're up to right now. And a few years ago, it seemed like all that stuff was going to happen at CES, and then it hasn't. So I think, you know, obviously some of that's economic, some of it's market driven, but that was something I always really liked about CES is you would see these like, you know, companies that really weren't on most people's radar, and then they'd pop up and they'd have great ideas, and they might go somewhere, but they might not. So to me, it was really a nice, like, incubator, if you will, for technology. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we've covered the uh, the hyper screen pretty well. I think we hit it pretty hard. Uh, I had fun talking with you, Terrence. I'm excited to see what Mercedes does next. Um, we can leave it right there. The next segment, we're going to see what Intel is doing at 1 o'clock Eastern time. Stay tuned for the official Best of CES Awards. Those are coming up on Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. It's been fun being with you guys. We'll see you later. <laughs>